quarterfinal action Friday, DSN. It's time to get cup crazy on this edition of TSN Sports Desk. The Oilers hope to avoid an avalanche in Colorado. The underdog Senators were running with the Devils in New Jersey, while the Sabres were looking to Buffalo their way past the Flyers. And the Stars went shark hunting deep in the heart of Texas. 15 seconds later, Alexander Dague feeding Chris Gratton, and he wires one under the crossbar. Just like that, it is tied up at two. But the celebration will not last. Gratton nailing Donald Odette along the boards, but he gets up, goes to the net, and puts home the rebound. That is your winner. Buffalo stunning Philly. 3-2 is the final. The Sabres draw first blood. The Flyers were 0 for 6 on the power play in this one. Hashik making 22 saves. Savota has compressed nerves in his neck. He was numb. He had numbness in one hand, but he is able to move all extremities. He is in stable condition and will be kept overnight for further tests. And according to Bobby Clark, will be out for a long time. Afterwards, Lindy Ruff talked about his team rallying after those two quick Philly goals. Well, it's, it's been one of our characteristics down the stretch here. Of, you know, we've come back in a lot of hockey games. So. In the Vancouver game, we came back, and uh, but we've had the uh, capability lately of coming back. Uh, even in New Jersey, we were we were down and came back. Ottawa, we were down and tied a game. Uh, we showed that we can score some goals to late in games to win them or tie them at least. Sure, anytime you get two goals scored in 30 seconds or whatever it is, it's going to shake you up a little bit. Obviously, we thought, thought we were in pretty good shape there, up to nothing, and next thing you know, it's a tie game. But it shows a lot of character on our part that uh, we were able to come back and. And squeeze it out. It sure did. Game one between the Bruins and Caps now. Boston back in the postseason, the most improved team in the NHL. Plenty of chances at both ends. Dave Ellett with a one-timer and a nice save by Olaf Kolzig. At the other end, Peter Bondra winds up, fires, and gets it right off the iron. Eventually, the Caps get on the board first. Brian Bellows gets into the middle and scores to make it one nothing Washington after one. Then more from them in the second. Pavanka with a sweet little pass here to Gonchar and even a, a better shot. What a Snipe. They're up 2-0 now, but the Bruins get one back. A couple of former Caps teaming up, Allison and Kristich. Kristich pass goes off a skate and in. Caps lead is down to one. Then a scary moment as Bondra is taken down awkwardly. It looked worse than it was. Sprained ankle. He did come back. Bruins looking to tie it. Anson Carter tries to stick handle in. Bellows almost put it into his own net, but Olaf had that one, and he had 27 in all. The Caps had an empty netter to take. Game one, 3-1 over Boston, and they love of that phone booth, including the regular season. The Caps are 11-0-1 in their last 12 games on home ice, and they've outscored opponents 38-16. That's a little home cooking for you, and it's working for them in the playoffs. To win the Stanley Cup, you have to be good, you have to be lucky, and you have to be healthy, at least healthy enough to lace on the skates and hold a stick. The defending Stanley Cup champs enter these playoffs with some significant injuries. None bigger than their leading goal scorer, Brendan Shanahan, out with a back injury. Scotty Bowman also missing Draper, Doug Brown, and Brent Gilchrist. Would it hurt them? Well, not when the other team's giving them five on threes. Takes just seven seconds to convert. Iserman to Lidstrom to the back of the net past Hadby Bullen. one nothing Detroit. Still in the first. Martana Point throws it in the net, and Joey Koser puts the rebound in off his skate. He didn't kick it in. This counts. It's good. 2-0. There's plenty more where that came from. Kozlov is stopped, but Sergei Fedorov right in front gets the rebound. 3-1 Detroit after one. There was no letting up in the second either. They're up 4-1. LaPointe wins the draw, and look who gets another one. Joey Koser is second in the game. That was it for old Nikolai. He was not ready to go. In comes Jimmy Waite, who has very little playoff experience, and it showed as he badly misplays this puck. Eisenman puts it off the post, but Kirk Maltby's right there to make it 6-1 after two. And with the game on cruise control, yeah, they let up a little bit. Cliff Ronning gets one right there to make it 6-2 wins. They added one more, but Detroit still wins a game one in a walk. There's the final, 6-3. Larry Murphy, LaPointe, and Eisenman each had two assists. Uh, more bad news for Phoenix. Teppo Newman had left the game in the second period due to a strained groin, but the hero was Joey Koser, recording his first two-goal game in more than six years in game one of the playoffs, and he was quite thrilled about that. Well, it, was, it was exciting. Uh, we got a big win. Uh, it was fun to get two goals, but uh, I know tomorrow you're going to be talking to somebody else, and I'll be able to go back into the back room. You know, it's game one. 
Uh, there's a lot of hockey to play. This is a team we're playing that is a very talented team that you can't take for granted in any aspect. And I think they showed that in the third period that they're not going to quit. So uh, we got to be aware of that and we got to be prepared to play Friday. To the Sharks and the Stars, Mike Modano and the Stars want to redeem themselves from their first round loss last year. Just over two minutes in, they set the tone. It's Joe Newendike on the break. It's Joe Newendike beating Mike Vernon. It's 1-0 Stars. Then just 37 seconds later, Modano's shot is stopped by Vernon, but there is Yuha Lean for the rebound. Just like that, it's 2-zip Dallas. But the Sharks do come back. They come back on the power play. Owen Nolan waiting and then firing short side on Ed Belfour. Sharks trail it 2-1. And that is when Mr. Marchman, yes, Brian Marchman, comes into this game and provides us with this clean hit on Joe Newendike as he runs him into the end boards. But Joe is clutching his knee. That is not good. He has had knee problems his entire career. He would leave the game. More on him in a moment. But the Stars do rally. They come storming out for the second. Medano, good chance. Vernon is there, but there is Darian Hatcher. The trailer is good. It's a 3-1 Stars lead. Third period. The Sharks trying to get another one past Ed Belfour. Joe Murphy to Bernie Nichols to the trailing Andre Zuzan. But Belfour makes the stop. He made 21 stops to give the Stars the win. Medano's empty netter would make it a 4-1 final. Mike Medano, a goal and two assists for the Stars. Yeri Lettinen had two assists as well. And Joe Neuendijk, the situation there is that he has a sprained knee. He had an MRI. Well, no results of that on Thursday. X-rays were negative. That is good. But still, some concern for the Stars. His X-rays were negative. Uh, he's taking an MRI right now. Uh, and uh, we'll know first thing in the morning on the MRI. Uh, right now, he has a sprained knee. And uh, best case scenario, day to day. Uh, worst case scenario, three weeks. But um, it could have been a lot worse than it is right now. It was a legit hit. I mean, you're, you, it was a legitimate hit. It was a, a hard play on a, on a player. Uh, Joe uh, was in a vulnerable position. And uh, no different than any of our defensemen would take a player out physically. It was a legitimate hit. Just happens to come up the same number all the time. I'm not out there to, to, to knock uh, Newendike out of the game tonight. I just. Coming up on the desk, Pittsburgh has a message from Montreal, but the Canadians were willing to do whatever it took to keep the upset fever alive. The Blues are as happy as hell to be playing the Kings in the playoffs. Will the NHL's long arm of the law reach out and suspend Bill Guerin? The NBA gets a second season underway, and the Jazz want a second chance at winning a title, but the Rockets were standing in their way. Our bank-to-back -back victories in the cards for the Expos, while Dave Steve is anxious to show his stuff against the Jazz. Hey, we got ourselves a rocking show full of surprises, so keep your head up. The desk is next. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the desk. Playoffs, playoffs, playoffs. Both the National Hockey League and NBA postseasons are underway, and that makes this a great time of the year. We're glad you tuned in. I'm Darren Detition. And I'm David Pratt. Well, that's like the man said, Predictions are for gypsies. <laughs> Even if you could have foreseen the way the NHL playoffs have started, who would have believed you? Yeah, now the question is, would they continue? With an injury list that rivals the Detroit Red Wings, but not nearly the same depth, the Montreal Canadiens limped into the playoffs. Having said that, this is the spring, and these are the Habs, and while they may not be a legitimate threat to win the Cup, they are still the Canadians. Saku Koivu could not play due to his broken hand. Andy Moog, he shut out the Pens two times this season. He gets the start. First period, Habs power play. Vinny Dampus has stopped. Martin Ruchinski, he whacks on the rebound. one nothing Canadian. Second period, Darius Kasparaitis rides Jonas Hoagland into the boards. He gets a deuce. Pens down two men. Kasparaitis doesn't like it, but that's interference. Just as the first Pens penalty expires, Brad Wawrinka out of the box, shorthanded goal. We got ourselves a tied hockey game, still in the second. Peter Popovich fakes the shot, then lets it go. He scores, 2-1 halves, Popovich is pumped. Barrasso was crying about interference, but it's Barrasso who's throwing the shot to Damfus as the puck flies by. Late in the second, Pans pressing, Moog scrambling, Alexi Morozov. 
Moog stones him with the blocker. Third period, Pens continue to press. Yarmer Yager throws it to the net. It's tipped in. Stu Barnes gets credit. The Habs argue, but the goal stands. It's 2-2. In overtime, Martin Stracka in all alone. He's stopped by Moog, but watch Patrice Brisebois. He knocks the net off its moorings. Rob Schick calls for a penalty shot. Alexi Morozov, he takes it, walks in, beats Moog, but he can't beat the iron. He gets nothing but post. Seconds after that, with extra men on the ice, a scuffle starts. Just over a minute to go in the first overtime. Benoit Brunet with the big shot. He scores. Brunet picks the top corner. Koivu and the other halves not dressed. They're celebrating. The black aces are on their feet. Can you believe it? Montreal does it again in OT, in the playoffs. Vinny Dampus assisted on the first two Canadian goals. Andy Moog finished with 33 saves for his first playoff win against Pittsburgh in nine starts. The penalty shot, just the second ever called in overtime of a playoff game. And afterwards, Benoit Brunet, he talked about his goal. I got a great pass from Bradley on the wing and I had some room and I just uh, teed the puck up. I didn't really look what I was shooting. I just wanted to hit the net and it went in. It was a big goal for me, you know. Uh, Barrasso was a really tough goalie to beat and uh, you don't have time to pick your spot with a goalie like that. I think our guys competed hard and played hard. We had a lot of guys, uh, you know, we got in some cases guys with a lot of experience. In some cases we got guys going through this for the first time and in general I think they played a good game, all the guys. With the injuries that we have, we feel that we, that's what we need to do right now. Play well defensively, but also we need to score some big goals. And uh, Wisinski of the first one and Pop Fick on our, uh, when we were on the ice to uh, score it. So uh, we did the job the first game. In the last week of the regular season, the St. Louis Blues and the L.A. Kings played each other in Los Angeles. The Blues scored four quick goals and they wanted to bury the Kings 7-3. Could that have been some kind of omen of things to come in the playoffs? Nah, not even the writers for the X-Files could produce a script that bizarre, right? Well, the truth is out there, and it's in goal. Grant Fuhr, 127 playoff games and four Stanley Cups. The other end, Stefan Fassé, just six playoff games and one cup in Colorado as a backup. Early on, St. Louis moves in. It's Courtnell to Dimitra. First shot on net. He beats Fassé. one nothing for the Blues. And St. Louis keeps it coming. But LaPerriere hooks Pierre Turgeon. As a result, the Blues on the power play here. Brett Hall gets it over to Courtnell. Quick release, and that made it 2 nothing for St. Louis. But just 18 seconds later, watch this. Gary Galley feeds Craig Johnson. He busts through and snaps it past Fuhr. Two to one for the Blues. Late in the first period. With Fosse out of position, Todd Gill shoots. Jim Campbell just tips it wide. Then Courtnell puts on a show. And what a show he put on. In the second period, Blues with another man advantage. Courtnell to Turgeon upstairs, where Norman keeps his mother. 3-1 Blues, and then the white towels started coming up. They were having a good time in St. Louis. Midway point of the second, Blues poured on. Courtnell to Dimitri to Campbell. Five hole on Fassé. They are making it look easy. Larry Robinson tries to stop the bleeding in his first playoff game as a head coach. But another St. Louis power play. Courtnell sets up Campbell. Gives to Courtnell four assists and five points and counting. Jamie Storr takes over. This is his first playoff game. We move on to the third now. More production for St. Louis. Rayon spots Hull, and it's party time at Akeel Center. Seven, seven to one for the Blues. But Courtnell is not finished here. Demetra scores his second. Courtnell counts his fifth assist. Let's do the math here. The goal and the assist, that's six points. Expectations already running high as the Blues crown the Kings the final eight. Count them. 8-3. Jeff Courtnell's six points are the most in a playoff game since Mary Lemieux had six back in 1992. And after the game, Courtnell said he was just fortunate the way things worked out. I was just lucky, I think, a lot on the power play. We, we scored some big goals. It just seemed, uh, you know, the puck was going in for us every time, uh, you know, I made a play or, uh, um, you know, we got a chance. It just went in early. It's a big win. First game's always tough at home, I think. Uh, you know, we didn't start that well, but I think uh, we came on as the game went on, stuck to our game plan. I think uh, a lot of guys were nervous, and uh, it's tough, but that's a big win for us.
Well, what a start for the Blues. You know, it is a microcosm of the Dallas Stars season. So successful, but yet at a price. On Wednesday, Joe Newendike was running to the boards. He immediately clutched his knee and will now miss the next three weeks with a torn right knee ligament. The incident happened late in the first period of their opening game with the San Jose Sharks. Newendike was run into the boards, ironically enough, by Brian Marchment and what was a clean check. Newendike was in obvious pain. He was taken off the ice into hospital. This is nothing new for the stars who have had to cope with key injuries throughout the season. What it means for us is that we have to play different now. That's the biggest change. It's not a change of this player's out, that player's out. It's that we have to play, we have to go back and play the way we did in games 41 to 60. We have to play different and we're going to have to do it without much notice like tomorrow. We will have more on the NHL playoffs coming up a little later on in the show including an up TSN. Pacific Prime. All eyes are on this playoff edition of the desk. We're going to bring all the action to you, and we're going all out to do it. Would the Avalanche cave in and lose another one to the Oilers? The Sens are poised to play giant killers against Jersey. Can Dallas cope without yet another star in their lineup? Well, the Coyotes were howling after their win over the Red Wings. They might be a world away from the playoffs, but Team Canada is out to defend its championship. Now, how much of a difference would Carlos Delgado make to the Blue Jays? lineup. Say it ain't so Mo. Lou hunts his former team at the Big O. The Bulls were ready to begin defense of their NBA championship as they battled the Nets. No buts about it. We're pumped up about this edition of Sports Desk. So grab a seat. It's coming up next. Hi everybody and welcome to the desk. In a seven game series there's a little room for error. But not much. We begin with the Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm Darren Detition. Glad you tuned in. And I'm David Pratt. David, there yeah. was guarded optimism for Edmonton yeah. fans heading into game yeah. two of the Oilers Colorado series as Joe was returning. Yeah, the Edmonton Oilers had a chance to do the unthinkable on Friday night. Take the first two games from the Avalanche in Colorado. The Avalanche had other plans thanks to the return of Joe Sackick after his one game suspension. Sackick, 70 points in 51 career playoff games. Yeah, you know he's back. First period, Peter Forsberg behind the net. He feeds Kamensky, and just like that, it's 1 0 for Colorado. It was going to be a long, long night. A little bit later on, check out Forsberg. He dances into the abs end here. Nice little move. Slides it by Cujo. That made it 2 0. And the rut was on. Hey, the coach, yeah, you know it. I could use a drink, you know it. Game, little chippy at times. Sackett gets the stick up on Marchant. That got him too. Oilers having a tough time beating Waugh on this night. He makes a nice save on Hamerlick to start the period, but the Oilers finally do solve him a little bit later on in the power play. Mironov will get it over to Garen. Watch the slap shot. That made it 2-1. to one. But before they can finish the celebration and blink, the abs strike right back. Shorthanded. Forsberg to Sackick. It all alone. Is that sweet? He beats Cujo. It's 3-1. to one. Patrick, you know he's happy about it. Yeah. Then Forsberg works his magic again. He finds Sackick. He beats Joseph. It's 4-1. to one. Cujo's night. Eh. It's over. You're out of there. He's replaced by Bob Essenza. Early in the third, the Avs seal it. Kamensky converts the giveaway. Long night for Ron Lowe and his troops is finally over. Colorado wins it. Peter Forsberg has four goals and three assists in his first two games of this series. Colorado improves to 18-1-6 and six when Forsberg scores and we'll have complete post-reaction a little bit later on in the show. In game number one, the Ottawa Senators pulled off the improbable as they beat the New Jersey Devils in overtime. Now I know they split their season series and perhaps we were underestimating Ottawa somewhat, but having said that, didn't you get the feeling that the Devils' talent would eventually overcome? After game one, Jacques Lemaire said the Devils played awful. Instead of giving the Senators any credit, the Sens must have gotten wind of that comment. Three and a half minutes in, Alexi Yashin will feed Chris Murray. He roofs it on Martin Brodeur. It's one zip Ottawa. But the Devils respond 
working with a four on three advantage. Brendan Morrison to Dougie Gilmore to Dave Andrichuk. We've seen that a few times. We got ourselves a 1 1 game. The Devils keep coming, but Rhodes isn't open for business. Second period, Doug Bodger with the shot. Rhodes makes the save. Randy McKay rattles the iron. Andrichuk's there for the rebound. Rhodes is going the wrong way. He throws the leg out and gets a piece of it. That's a great save. Doug Gilmore has been on every Devil's point in the playoffs, and the Sands make sure they give him the rough ride. But these are the playoffs. He's going to tough it out. He follows the play in. Scott Niedemeyer will find him with a minute two left in the second period. It's 2-1 Jersey. Third period, the Senators throwing everything at the Devils. Igor Kravchuk with some fancy stick work around the net. He sends it out in front. Bartam Brodeur is down, but he makes the save. The Devils had an empty netter to seal the 3-1 victory, but the Sens don't go quietly as the buzzer goes. So do some knuckles. The Devils head to Ottawa with a split. Dougie Gilmore has points on all four Devils goals in the first two games. He has been on fire. Martin Brodeur made 27 saves for the win. He improves to 9-2-4 and four this season following a loss. Afterwards, Doug Gilmore was talking about his series so far and how everybody has to contribute. When uh, the playoffs start, every, you count on everybody. And we said it before, the, the guys that are counted upon to score and, and set up plays have to, have to go out and do that. I was watching Dougie playing in the second period and I, I felt that he's in the zone where he he wanted the puck. He came back to our zone, get the puck. He, he was taking the puck off our guy's sticks because he wanted he wanted to be the guy, and he, he was the guy tonight. And Dave Vanderchuk had a solid effort. You know, sometimes the, he, he Dave always puts puts the effort for the team, and sometimes when we lose, it's overlooked. But he's always there for the team, and uh, it, it showed tonight. The Dallas Stars went into game two of their series with San Jose without Joe Newendike. As you know, Newendike tore up his knee in game one and is gone for at least the next two weeks. It put all the pressure on Mike Madano, who was expected to pick up the offense. Brian Marchment, you know, public enemy number one for his game one check on Newendike. A minute and 25 in. Dallas on a power play. Letting it. Backhands the rebound by Vernon. That made it one nothing for the Stars. And then it's time for a little payback here. Bob Bassett just cranks Marchment. And later on, Mike Madano, he tries to rub out Marchment. Still in the first now. The uh, Sharks scramble in their own end. Darian Hatcher scores on the big blast. You know, it takes a worried man to sing a worried song. So they say it in Calgary. 2 nothing Dallas. In the second, Ragnarsson meets Madano. Now, he gets his stick up. Madano feels it, and the stars just keep falling. Ken Hitchcock, he has seen this movie before. Madano leaves with a mild concussion, but it is not that serious. Later in the second, even though it looked serious, it wasn't that serious. Later in the second, Dallas presses. Dave Reed gets it to Verbeek. That's his first. 3 nothing for the stars. And the fans, yeah, they're going wild at Reunion Arena. In the third, Nolan crushes Ed Belford, trying to shake him up right there. Ludwig comes right to the rescue. Nolan pays the price for that, the final 5-2 for the Stars. The Dallas Stars went 4 for 14 on the power play. That was the difference. Ed Belford faced just 20 shots, stopping 19 for the win. And after the game, head coach Ken Hitchcock talked about the injury to Madano. Madano has a, or had a slight concussion. Uh, he's fine. He was taken out of the third period. For precautionary reasons only, uh, he's ridden the bike and he's cleared to play on Sunday. And we have no other injuries to report other than Newendike and Adams. On we go now to the Coyotes in the wings. Nikolai Heavy Bulin shelled for six goals in game number one. The first period, 2-1 Coyotes scramble in front. Heavy Bulin robs Darren McCarty. Second period, score 3-1. to one. Wings power play. Larry Murphy gives it away to JR. Ronick makes no mistake. It's 4-1 Coyotes minutes later. Another Wings power play. Dmitry Miranov gives it away to JR. That's a sweet move. 5-1 Coyotes. The Wings answer. Matthew Dandino redirects a pass upstairs. The one-timer. That makes it 5-2 Phoenix. The Coyotes answer that. Keith Kachuk wanks in the rebound. That makes it 6-2. The Wings respond to that. Sergei Federer as he falls to the ice. Four goals in a minute 46. 6-3 Coyotes after two as the traditional octopus makes its appearance. Third period, more scoring. Dallas Drake to Rick Tockett. 
Nice touch. Phoenix puts seven goals on the board. Coyotes go on to win game number two, seven to four. Detroit defensemen were turning the puck over in this game. Left, right, and center. The Wings did outshoot the Coyotes, 38 to 28. Jeremy Roenick had two goals and two assists for Phoenix. This was the Wings' first home loss in their last 11 games. Okay, Dutch, let's get on to the Sabres and the Flyers. Philly has got to got to find a way to beat Hasek. Five minutes into the first, Dan McGillis moves in. Hasek with one stop. Lindris gets the rebound as he's falling. That made it one nothing. That's how you do it. Philadelphia playing physical on this one. John LeClaire drills Verata. Sean Burt coming up big on the two on one. Stones Holzinger. A little bit later on, LeClaire goes after Verata. Yada 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 again. Hey, he was down for a while, but he did stay in the game, was not hurt. Second period, Hasek cannot clear the puck. Chris Gratton makes him pay. Stick side, second of the playoffs, and that made it 2-0. Two and a half minutes into the third period, Matthew Barnaby just walks out. Grosick pops in to rebound, 2-1, to one, and suddenly the Sabres were back in this thing. Buffalo keeps coming. This team just does not quit. Dixon Ward down a wing, rips it off the post. What a great shot, 2 all. Sabres trying to contain Lindros in this one. Zitnik knocks him into the bench and then tries, tries to keep him. No, nah, no, nah, you're not going to do that. Less than four minutes left. Flyers on the power play. Lindros feeds Leclerc. No mistake. 3-2. And then things get just, yeah, a little chippy. Desardins gets the hit, but Grosick, watch, butt ends him in the bench right there. Right in the chops. Grosick gets four minutes for that. Rob Ray's not too happy about it. Barnaby loses it. He's tossed. The Razor loses it, too. He has some choice words as the Sabres lose their cool and then lose the game. 3-2 is the final. The Flyers were just 1-11 on the power play. That's all they needed. Sean Burke made 21, rather 25 saves for the win. Dutch? On we go now to the Bruins and the Capitals. This was a good game as well. Peter Bondra with a tender ankle. Back in the Caps lineup on Friday. First period. Caps on the power play. Adam Oates to Phil Housley. To Essa Tikkanen. He puts it by Byron Defoe. Second of the playoffs. It's one zip. Later, Mark Tenorti's going after Ted Donato. He wants a piece of him. In jumps Kenny Baumgartner. Who says they don't fight in the playoffs? They start trading him. It was a pretty good tilt as they're checking the knuckles. One up in Caps after one. We go to the second. Caps in tight. Kelly Miller all alone in front of Defoe, but watch the stick save. Miller can't lift it up. Defoe gets to paddle on it. Later, Bruins looking to get on the board. Steve Hines all alone in the slot. Are you kidding me? Kolzig robs him. Third period, caps up 2-1. to one. Boston in on the two-on-one. P.J. Axelson, low shot by Kolzig. We're tied at two. Late in the third, Bruins in the power play. There's a scramble in front of Ole the goalie. Darren Van Amp scoots in from the point, flips home the loose puck. Bruins up 3-2. to two. Under a minute left in the game. Kolzig on the bench, extra man. Sergey Goncher with the point shot. He scores. 36 seconds left. We're going to OT. In fact, we went to double overtime. 54 seconds in. Jason Allison to Van Imp. He beats Kolzig. Bruins win it 4-3. to three. The series is now tied up at one apiece. This was the sixth straight playoff overtime loss for the Caps, and three of them have come on April the 24th. That's some pretty weird stuff. Jason Allison had a goal and two assists for Boston. Okay, we have to take a short break, but still to come on the desk, the Jays welcome. A Ahead on TSN Sports Desk. The Oilers were looking for a break in Game 3 with the Avalanche, but not that kind of a break. While the Senators are a big hit in Game 3 with the Devils. Did Pat and the Bruins get burned in their game with the Capitals? The Coyotes were comeback crazy in Phoenix. It was Demolition Derby Day at the NASCAR event at Talladega. While Villeneuve was ready to maneuver his way onto the podium at the San Marino Grand Prix. The Blue Jays and White Sox battled with the elements in the Windy City. It was nothing but net a gain for Jordan against New Jersey. Lori Kane was more than able on this week's stop on the LPGA Tour. Hey, we've got so much coming up, it's scary. So come just a little bit closer for a better look. Sports Desk is next. If you're a serious hockey fan and your team is no longer around, then pick an underdog, jump aboard the postseason bandwagon because you don't want to miss all the fun. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Gino Retta. And I'm David Pratt. 
David, the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs are now in full swing, and we're beginning to see some rather unusual trends developing in postseason play. Yeah, to say the least, you know, after the first four days of this year's NHL playoffs, the home team had won just 10 of the first 16 games played. In other words, so much for home ice advantage. Nevertheless, Saturday night, the Edmonton Oilers were looking for anything to help them deal with Peter Forsberg and the Colorado Avalanche. Yanni Ninema back after missing game two with a concussion. After a big game two, Peter Forsberg getting lots and I mean lots of attention from the Oilers. But Forsberg keeps coming. Already, 1-0 for the Avs. His pass gets deflected to Claude Lemieux. It's a power play goal. And just like that, it's 2-0. Let's get out of the second period now. The Oilers get one back. Rem Murray feeds Marinov. Here comes the big shot. That made it 2-1. to one. Just three minutes later, Colorado on the power play. Ozilich feeds Adam Deadmarsh the one-timer, and it's 3-1. to one. The Oilers, they just they couldn't buy a break. Zelopukin on the breakaway, and he breaks his stick. Can you believe that? But they keep coming. Power play. Hamerlick's shot is tipped by Doug Waite, and that cut the lead to 3-2 after two. But just two minutes into the third, Lemieux tips in the pass from Ozilinch. But hold on, hold on here, hold on. Is he in the crease? They go, they go upstairs to review it. No question. I mean, no question his foot is in, but they call it a goal, and that made it 4-2. The Oilers, no quit here. They come back. Bill Guerin down the wing, blasts it through the five hole. That made it 4-3. Then just over a minute later, the Oilers dump it in. Should be an icing call, but there is no call here. The Avalanche are caught looking. Herkut gets the loose puck, feeds it to Buckberger. He fires it, and that made it 4-4. Hey, everybody, guess what? We're going to overtime. Less than five minutes to go in the first OT. Four on four. Joe Sackett down the wing. You've seen this movie before. Short side. Colorado wins it. 5-4. Wow, what a game. Ozilinch had four assists for the Avalanche. The Oilers lost all three regular season home games to Colorado this season, and now one in the playoffs. And after the game, Joe Sackick said, even with a two-goal lead, they knew the game was not over. Two-goal leads uh, are really uh, uh, not very big, and uh, they got a lot of speed, and uh, uh, they got a great hockey team, and every game is going to get tougher from here. It's tough the way we lost. It uh, made a big mistake at, at their blue line and turned around in our net, and uh, it's disappointing. Uh, we come back, we fought back hard. Uh, we have to quit getting two goal leads because it's, you know, it's an up, uphill battle from then on. But uh, it's just a bad mistake and uh, ended up in our net. So I went to a number of playoff pools earlier this week, and I didn't see a lot of Ottawa Senators get chosen. That makes sense. Ottawa finished eighth in the East. They're up against the top seeded Devils. So what are the chances? Well, you know what? Their chances are looking better every day. Series tied at one as they shifted to the Corral Center in Ottawa for Game 3. Stan Netzkash back after some minor surgery. knee surgery for Game 3. Sends get the early opportunity. Daniel Alfredson thinks he scored. He's even celebrating, but Robert robbed him. Later, Devils on a bad change. Sergey Zoltok rips it off the iron. Doug Gilmore, a marked man after the first two games. Yanni Laukin and just nails him. Damian Rhodes gets tested early and often. Devil shorthanded. Brian Rolston breaks in. Rhodes comes through with a big stop. Still scoreless after one. But 36 seconds into the second, Steve Thomas shoots it. Rebound comes out to Bobby Carpenter, who converts. No chance for Rhodes on that. And it's 1-0 for the Devils. The Sens come back. Zoltok, another great opportunity. Beats Brodeur, but puts it off the iron. But they keep on coming on the power play. Laukinen scores. Nice goal. Top shelf. 1-1 tie. The crowd. He's loving it. Third period, Alexei Yashin just gets drilled by Scott Stevens. Never saw him coming, but he would be heard from a little later. Sergei Zoltok gets another chance. Fires it. Roder gets a piece of it, goes wide. This one is going to overtime. A minute into the overtime period, Dave Anderchuk breaks in. Anderchuk beats Rhodes, but finds the iron. Seconds later, the Sens come back. Magnus Arvidsson set alone. Lyle Odeline brings him down. Penalty shot? No, but a penalty. Yes, Oderline gets two for holding. Sends go on the power play. A minute 19 later, Laukinen feeds Alexei Yashin, who is the hero, as he beats Brodeur for the overtime winning goal. Two to one, your final score. Huge victory for the Sens. A huge performance by Damian Rhodes, who made 30 stops. The Sens now lead the series two games to one. And afterwards, Alexei Yashin says, you know what, everything just came together perfectly for his game winner, no T. I got a good pass from uh, Yanni walking in and it was right on the tape, so I shoot the puck uh, at the net and finally it's went in. It's uh, 
It's probably the greatest moment in my life so far. There was a, a few that, like in the third period that I didn't see. I lost my stick and Niedermeyer shot it. It happened to hit me. It just happened to be in the middle of the net. And things are going good right now. And, uh, you know, I'm going to keep doing the same things to keep it going. Teron Wilson and the Capitals in Boston without their 52 goals scorer Peter Bondra, who's out with an ankle injury. Closing moments of the first period. Caps on the power play. Joe Juno with the shot. Defoe can't control the rebound. Sergey Gonchar does, and it's 1 0 Washington. Second period, the Capitals break out on the four on two. Dale Hunter drops it for Sergey Gonchar. Top of the slot. Five hole, 2 0 for the Caps. Gonchar's fourth of the playoffs. But back come the Bruins. Sergey Samsonov plays a little give and go with Mike Sullivan, leaving for Kyle McLaren. Wide open, tucks it in. 2 to 1 Capitals after two. Third period, Bruins on the power play. Ray Bork puts it on net. Dimitri Christich beautifully redirects it. Pass to Foe to all to overtime for the second straight game. Bruins are buzzing. Kolzik with the save. Anson Carter, open net, can convert. Bruins keep on pressing. Rob DeMaio working from behind the net. Goes in front. PJ Axelson scores. Game's over. Bruins win an OT. Not really. Because the official goes upstairs. Pat Burns can't believe it. I can't tell you what he says. Paul Dvorsky says no goal. Look at this. This is why. Taylor's toe is in the crease. That's brutal. As Burns will tell you and as the fans in Boston will tell you. The second overtime period for the second straight game. Adam Oates from behind the net spots Joey Juno all alone in front. He converts. Two former Bruins win the game for the Caps in a rather controversial final. 3-2. The Caps were outshot 54-27. Olaf Kolzik made 52 saves for the huge victory. So if you're a Bruins fan, it's a brutal call. If you're a fan of the Caps, hey, you'll take it. Fortunately, they have that video review. And if I was going to make a change to it, uh, I mean, if someone's in the crease who's not involved in the play, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the goal should count. But uh, you, follow, you have to follow the rules. And we got a fortunate break, a couple of breaks, actually, in overtime. They had some power plays. And uh, our goaltender and some of the penalty killers did an outstanding job. Obviously, it's a big break. I mean, it is a rule, and it happens to every, everybody. But more so the way we played. I mean, uh, they really took it to us. And to come out with a win is, you know, really lucky. The Winnipeg Whiteout has moved to the Valley of the Sun. Game three of the Wings Coyotes. Total of 20 goals so far in this series. And Detroit adds that number in a hurry. Eisenman hits Fedorov 30 seconds into the game. And it's 1-0 Detroit. Just 31 seconds after that, the Wings strike again. Brendan Shanahan will poke at the loose puck here. And just like that, it's 2-0 for the Wings. But in the third... The momentum changes, and it changes in a hurry. Tepidoski puts one off. Chris Osgood. Rick Tockett picks up the rebound. Phoenix down by just one. And with that, the Coyotes start to howl. Watch this as Jeremy Roenick through the middle. He lets fly from the blue line. And Osgood cannot handle this shot. He has to watch as it goes into the net. It's all tied 2-2. So let the howling begin. And there was lots of it late in the game. Tepardowski off the faceoff, through some traffic. Ronick gets his stick on this shot. Once they, once they stop with the cheering, we'll get onto it here. Off the faceoff here, watch as Ronick gets his stick on it. Phoenix takes the lead with that, as the wings feel like an anvil has been dropped on their heads. Coyotes, 3-2 over Detroit. What a party. In Phoenix. You gotta love it. Tepardowski had three assists for Phoenix. Jeremy Roenick's first goal Sunday was his 40th career playoff goal. On to the Stars and on to the Sharks. And some good news here. Mike Modano back in the lineup for Dallas. All you need to know about these fans is, well, they, they live in California. More on that later. Stars strike first on the power play. Zubov rips the point shot past Mike Vernon. That's his first of the playoffs. one nothing for the Stars. This was with the turn of Eddie Belford to San Jose. Trust me, you can never, ever go home. But Belford responded. Joe Murphy, the one-timer here. Belford will shut the door. Then Mike Vernon, he's also equal to the task. Madonna walks right in, and Vernon is there. The Sharks even up the score. Watch this as Madano is cruising. John McClain takes him out. And then on the same play, Murphy to McClain. The first shot is stopped, but he puts in the rebound, and that made it 1-1. 
The stars then start to come apart. Bob Bassett, he just goons it up with Brian Marchman. On the power play, Patrick Marlowe will find Nolan. The one-timer here, he just rifles it. That made it two to one for the Sharks. And remember, kids, this is this is California. Joe Montana on hand for the game, and he did bring his magic. 3-1 here. Mike Rathjen with the weak one-timer. Somehow, this will beat Belfour, and that made it 4-1. to one. Dallas totally loses it here. Sean Burke pushed over Ed Belfour. He goes right after him. Belfour was tossed from this one as the Sharks go on to win it. 4-1 to one is the final. John McClain had a goal and two assists to lead the Sharks. The, Shar the star Playoffs. See it. Live it. TSN. We're glad you could drop in for this edition of TSN Sports Desk. And for that, we salute you. The Penguins try to avoid a Canadian's lead in their series, while the Kings were looking for a big hit as they returned to Hollywood. It was Philly showing signs of frustration in Game 3, while the Sabres were marching to a different tune. With the Cavs stumble to a series win over the Pacers, it's nice to be McDice. Unless you live in San Antonio, Rocket Roger was firing on all cylinders in New York, while Carlos Perez was hoping for no Big Mac attack in St. Louis. It wasn't a great race for some at the Bosch Spark Plug Grand Prix. And then, uh, whoop. Our plays of the week will have you jumping for joy, so don't throw a tantrum. You're in good hands. Sort of. The desk is next. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the desk. The National Hockey League playoffs continue, and that's exactly where we begin. We're glad you tuned in. I'm Darren Detisha. And I'm Farhan Lalji in Vancouver. Dutch only three Canadian teams in the Stanley Cup playoffs this year, but so far they're waving the Maple Leaf proudly. Indeed they have. You know, as much as a return to Montreal conjures up images of the past, the cold hard reality for the Montreal Canadiens remained the same. Their goal scorers had to start scoring. Mark Recchi, Shane Corson and Brian Savage had yet to tally in the series, and in two games only had 13 shots between them. Yammer Yager hasn't scored in this series either, but he does have four assists. First period, five minutes in, Yager down the wing. He rips one by Andy Moog, his first of the playoffs, and for that, we get the mile-high salute. one nothing Pants. More bad news for the Habs. Patrice Brisebois tries to hit Robert Long. He goes head first into the boards. He was down for a while, but Brisebois was able to get up with some help. He did return to the game. Now, finally, the late in the period, Montreal gets it going. Vinny Damphus to Brian Savage to Martin Rachinsky all alone in front. He rifles it upstairs on Barrasso. The game is tied at one. Even though it was a penalty-filled first period, neither team could convert with a man advantage, and that may prove to be the difference. Second period, Habs in the power play. Could they get it done? Danfus to Corson in front. He shoots and scores his first of the playoffs. Montreal up 2-1. to one. Let's flash back to game one in Pittsburgh. Alexi Moore is up with a penalty shot on Moe. He goes to the backhander, denied. Back to game three, second period, Morozov tries the exact same move on Moog, and again, Morozov denied. The Canadians getting stronger with each period played, and in the third, a beautiful goal. Recky to Carson, who finishes it off, his second of the game, 3-1 Montreal. They lead the series two games to one. Mark Recky and Vincent Dampus each had two assists for the Canadian. Shane Corson also played an outstanding hockey game. Pittsburgh 0 for 6 on the power play, and the Penguins were held to just 20 shots on net after the game. Vinny Dampus said Montreal's aggressiveness was the key. We hit their defense, hit their, the guys that were, uh, th that were there to hit. We didn't uh, pass hit when we had a chance, and the big guys uh, did the job. Uh, Turner, uh, Scott Thornton, uh, Corson, all those uh, big uh, rough forwards uh, played real well. Nothing we can do about this game now. I mean, uh, it's over and done with. You know, we're down two on the series. We know the situation we're in, and uh, you know, we've got to get focused and ready for game four. I mean, right now that's the critical one, and... Uh, you know, we've got to make some adjustments. Obviously, when you don't win, uh, it's not good enough, and you've got to find a way to, to win the hockey game. We quit with the body checking. That's uh, that's what probably cost us the hockey game, you know, because we give away some uh, good chances to them, and they score. 
With five underdogs leading their respective series, this year's playoffs have been anything but predictable. But one series that has held true to form is the battle in the West between the Blues and the Kings. St. Louis has looked impressive with a pair of wins at home, while the Kings were looking for their first win of the series in what would be their first home playoff game in five years. Larry Robinson going back to Jamie Storr for game three after 25 saves in game two. First period, the Kings take the body. Luke Robitaille runs Terry Yake into the boards. Just a sign of things to come on the power play. Duchesne to Brett Hull in the slot, but Jamie Storr comes up with the big save, and the Kings would continue to take the body. Glenn Murray runs over Chris Pronger. Now some more hitting. Ian LaPerrier hits Pronger behind the net. The Kings keep it in. It's Steve McKenna with the pass over to Ray Ferraro. LaPerrier just gets a piece of it, and it's 1-0 for the Kings. Another weird one late in the period. Kings on the power play. Fuhrer with the bad clearing attempt. Robitaille fires it at the net. Yannick Perot deflects it. It goes in, and LaPerrier says, nice one. It's 2-0 after one. Second period as a result of a rough play. LaPerrier has to get his nose fixed. How would you like to have that happen to you? Third period, it's 3-0. Jeff Cortnell nails Jamie Storr beside the net, and he's head hits the crossbar. O'Donnell goes after Cortnell, and O'Donnell winds up with a five-minute major for fighting. A five-minute power play for St. Louis. What a brutal call. The Blues already scored once on this power play. Then Jim Campbell feeds Brett Hull. Another power play goal cuts the lead to 3-2. to two. Same power play. Al McKinnis with the shot. This one's going to get tipped in front by Pierre Turgeon, and the Blues tie it on three power play goals. Larry Robinson stunned that this game is tied. Still on the same power play off the faceoff. It's Duchesne with the shot from the points. Terry Ake jumps on the rebound, and incredibly, the Blues lead 4-3. to three. Storr played well, but he was victimized. 4-3 to three was the final. The four power play goals equal an NHL playoff record with uh, most power play goals by one team in one period. Pronger and McKinnis, meanwhile, each had one assist. What a horrendous call against the Kings. You know, they are big, they are physical, but the Philadelphia Flyers are also in trouble. Through the first two games of this series with the Sabres, it has become obvious they are having a very hard time dealing with Buffalo's team speed. Now, Peter Swoboda back in the Flyers lineup after that scary incident in game number one, but the Sabres got Mike Pekka back from his knee injury. Sabres get started early on. The puck takes a kind Sabre bounce right to Miroslav Shetan. He scores. It's 1-0 Buffalo. This one was nasty at times. Luke Richardson gives Dixon Ward the lumber. The Flyers, though, can't beat Hasek. Roddy Brendamore, the open net, he can't lift it upstairs. Lindros and Leclerc then both in the box. Just as they get out of the penalty box, Matthew Barnaby goes to work. Barnaby with a sweet pass to Michael Groshek who goes shelf. It's 2 out than Sabres. More from Dominic Hashin. Derek Desjardins, he walks right in, but he can't beat the Dominator. 3 out than Sabres, they keep coming. Short-handed, Wayne Primo, who's had a good series. He's stopped. Daryl Shannon's there. He bangs in the rebound. It's 4 out than Buffalo. Still short-handed. Dixon Ward with the steal. He feeds Brian Holzinger. And look at the lumber. He catches all of it, wires it home. Four goals and nine shots for the Sabres in the second. That makes it five to nothing. The Sabres and their fans going cup crazy as they absolutely embarrass Philadelphia. Six to one. Jason Woolley and Dixon Ward each had two assists apiece. Now the Sabres scored four goals on special teams. Two short-handed, two on the power play. Right now, Buffalo is playing very, very well, both offensively and defensively. They're a big overall team, probably the biggest team in the league, I think. And uh, so part of our job is because everyone knows how good Dom is, and if he's going to see the puck, he's going to stop it. Uh, you know, we have to clear the lanes, let him see things. And uh, it's not always that easy, but uh, that's what we try to do. We didn't play well off the bat. You know, the first period, we got away with only being down by one. And uh, all night long, we, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a struggle out there. But uh, that's uh, it's game three, and we knew it wasn't going to be easy, but at the same time, we, uh, we got to face adversity a whole lot better than, uh, than what we did tonight. The National Hockey League playoffs return to TSN on Tuesday as the Phoenix Coyotes play host to the Detroit Red Wings as the defending Stanley Cup champs are in danger of going down three games to one in their best of seven series. Now, contrary to the atmosphere in Phoenix, I don't think the Red Wings are ready to wave the white flag as of yet. Still to come on the desk, it's NBA playoff.
head on the desk how sweet it is for Daniel Alfredson and the Sands. The Oilers are still looking for a way to stop Forsberg. Could the Red Wings handle the heat in Phoenix? The Capitals were sticking it to the Bruins again. Would the Sharks be seeing stars against Dallas? It was a black day for Craig Hartsburg in Chicago, while Canadian teams say, read my lips. No taxes. Charles Oakley and the Knicks were going all out against the Heat, while the Yankees were reaching back for that little extra against the Blue Jays. The big unit was still looking for his first win against the Royals. Been on your feet all day and need a break? Let Sports Desk help relax you. Take a load up. No buts about it. We got all the hits. The desk is next. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the desk. You know, the great thing about the NHL playoffs is that the improbable often happens. We're glad you tuned in. I'm Darren Detitian. And I'm Farhan Lalji in Vancouver. Darren, the Ottawa Senators had to wait until the final week of the regular season to clinch a playoff spot. Now they're ready to shock the hockey world. And that is exactly where we start. David versus Goliath, a modern-day Cinderella. The cliches are being liberally applied to the Ottawa Senators, and they are deserving of every one. A decided underdog going into their series with New Jersey, the Senators, much to their credit, have simply been the better of the two teams. Damian Rhodes leads all goaltenders in the playoffs with a 1.28 goals against average, and he's tested early and often in this one, shorthanded. Dennis Peterson breaks in, he scores. It's 1-0 Jersey. The Devils keep it coming. Lyle Lodeline with a point shot. Bobby Carpenter tries to bury the rebound, but he rattles it off the post. Moments later, Bobby Holik left all alone in front. He gets a couple of wanks at it, but look at Rhodes. He was sensational. And late in the period, Scott Stevens with a horrible pass up the middle. Picked off by Alfredson. He beats Martin Brodeur's stick side. We're tied at one, and Stevens is left to ponder that costly pass. Second period, the Sens come out flying. Sean McEachran controlling the puck with one hand on the stick. He feeds Alfredson for his second of the game, 2-1 Ottawa. Then the Devils try and stir things up. Christoph Oliva hammers Yanni Laukinen into the boards. What a hit. Laukinen was okay. All it did was fire up the Sens. Later in the power play, mad scramble. Jason York steps into one. His first career playoff goal, it is 3-1 Ottawa. Then it's Alfredson again, down the wing. He goes five hole on Brodeur. Alfredson with a hat trick, 4-1 Ottawa in control, at least we thought. Then Scott Stevens skates over center. He shoots it at the net. Somehow it gets by Rhodes. The lead's cut to four to two. With the score four three, time winding down. Dougie Gilmore in the slot denied by Rhodes. The Sens hang on to win a wild one four to three is the final. They now lead the series three to one and can wrap it up in Jersey. Alfredson's hat trick was the first by a senator at the Corral Center this season. Afterwards, he said, "Now it." Really really gets tough. To win the fourth one, as I said, it's the toughest one, so uh, uh, we got a lot of work to do, but I mean, uh, we're giving ourselves a chance here, and uh, we just got to go out and play the same way. This team is playing with a lot of confidence. They're playing uh, probably their best hockey that uh, they played all year. You know, we're spending time in the, in, uh, in the penalty box, and I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the way it goes. You know, we're going to have to really uh, be focused and, you know, do, do something different about this because uh, you know, it's keep hurting us. They say that game four is always the biggest game in any seven game series and if the Edmonton Oilers were going to get back into their series with the Avs they would need to get off to a better start. The Oilers have fallen behind in all three games to this point and were only able to complete the comeback in game one. Edmonton would also need a big game from Curtis Joseph. He's looked very ordinary giving up 11 goals in three games. In the other net it was Patrick Waugh going after career playoff victory number 99. Oiler fans getting the finishing touches for game four. This one gets off to a real physical start. Kelly Buckberger with his head down. Peter Forsberg comes up with the big hit right at center ice. I bet you Don Cherry loves that. Patrick Waugh gets started in the first. Scott Fraser in close, but Waugh gets the blocker down. But the oil would draw first blood. Doug Waite, the great cross-ice pass over to Ryan Smith. A power play goal, 1-0 for the oil. 
But 17 seconds later, Claude Lemieux's shot goes wide, but his centering pass finds Peter Forsberg. It's his fifth goal of the playoffs. Ron Lowe not too happy. 1-1 one, one after one. Second period, the goalies take over. Curtis Joseph with a big rebound. Kamensky the move. Cujo the save. But Waugh had an answer. Bill Guerin slips by the D. Waugh sticks out the pad. We're still tied after two. These guys are having a good time, obviously. They're not too bright. The Oilers keep the pressure coming. Guerin from point-blank range. Smith cannot get to the loose puck. But the tie is finally broken in the third period. It's Forsberg to Claude Lemieux down the right wing. He fires one to the far post. It's his 73rd career playoff goal. That's a guy we love to hate, but he gets it done. Two to one. The Oilers don't quit, though. Rem Murray with the wraparound. Then the scramble in front, but the Oilers would come up short. Uh, the Avs add an empty netter. The Oil go back to Colorado down three games to one. The Avs win this one three to one. Forsberg had two goals and one assist. That gives him 11 points to lead all playoff scorers. Patrick Waugh, meanwhile, had 26 saves for his 99th career playoff victory. After the game, we had a chance to talk to Doug Waite, and he was obviously disappointed with the outcome. I don't think they had many chances on turnovers, and uh, they get one both games, and they, and they win it, and it, it, it sucks, and uh, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm pissed off. I'm down. I'm upset about it, but uh, we're not dead. I mean, hey, like I say, when you're in every game, uh, anything can happen, and we got a lot of hardworking guys here, so we're going to keep working. The whole team worked really hard tonight, and uh, I think that we got the goal. I think, you know, the other Lions had a couple of great chances, too. They could have got, got a couple of goals, and uh, I think it was really a team effort tonight, and the Patrick was really on, too. Game four, the Wings and the Coyotes. Chris Draper returning from a knee injury. Phoenix strikes first. Power play. Rick Tockett sneaks one past Osgood. Weak goal. That's his fifth of the series. It's 1 0. The Coyotes keep coming. Short handed. Keith Kachuk on the breakaway. Osgood with an enormous save. Still in the first period. Another short-handed chance. This time, Norman McIver's robbed by Osgood. Second period, Brendan Shanahan with a shot. Igor Larionov is all over the rebound. That ties the game up at one. Three minutes later, great work by the wings behind the net. Fedorov feeds Slava Kozlov. It's 2-1. Bad news for the Coyotes. Nikolai Habi Bulin leaves with a groin pull. He will be reevaluated on Wednesday. Dying seconds of the period. Jamie McCowan. Pops in a rebound just before the buzzer. 3-1 after two. Third period. Detroit continues to roll. Nicholas Lidstrom with a blast from the wing. 4-1 Red Wings. Tempers then flare near the end of the game. The Coyotes a little frustrated as they drop this one. 4-2. to two. The defending champs are very much alive. Brendan Shanahan with a couple of helpers. Chris Osgood with 32 saves. The Wings, even the series, heading home at two games apiece. All right, to the Stars and Sharks, Eddie Belfour looking to recover after a disastrous game three. First period, it's Marcus Ragnarsson. His point shot is stopped. Murray Craven misses on the doorstep. Joe Murphy is also stopped. There would be a lot of saves in this one. Sharks come out fired up. Dave Lowry rocks Daryl Sador up against the glass, but the Sharks can't beat Belfour. Patrick Marlowe coming in down the left wing. He cuts in front. Belfour is there to make the save as Jeff Friesen crashes into the open net. We're scoreless after one. Second period, it's Marlowe again with the steal. Nice behind the back pass to Owen Nolan, but once again, Belfour is there. Belfour obviously not popular, and he is blanking the Sharks. Vernon, meanwhile, not tested until late in regulation. Under 10 seconds left in this one, Verbeek centers to Dave Reed. He can't bang it in, neither can Benoit Hogue. So guess what? We are going to overtime. The goal judge wanting to be put to work in this game. Six and a half minutes in, the Stars can't clear the puck. Bernie Nichols from behind the net. He would feed it out in front to Andre Zuzan. Who? Andre Zuzan. He gets, he lets it go from the slot. That beats Eddie Belfour. The Sharks even the series is at two as the fans go crazy. One nothing was your final. As for Zuzan, that was his first career playoff point. Mike Vernon, meanwhile, comes up with his sixth career playoff shutout. On we go now to the Capitals and the Bruins. Chris Simon returns after missing 57 games with a shoulder injury. Simon in the thick of things. Kyle McLaren spins him down later on. Grant Ledyard drills Simon. Still in the first four-on-four four situation. The Bruins turn it over. Joey Juno feeds Adam Oates. He picks up his first of the playoffs. It's one nothing Washington. We go to the second period. Dave Ellett appends Todd Krieger. Ellett gets the gate. Ensuing Caps power play. The puck comes to Oates at the side, and then it goes through Defoe. 
For the fourth time in four games, Washington leads it 2 0. Boston tries to bounce back the mad scramble. Anson Carter denied by only the goalie in the third. Bruins pressing. Sergei Samsonov can't hit the target. Later on, Brendan Witt gets double teamed. And I do mean drilled midway through the third. Boston gets caught in a line change. Ken Clay, that's a backbreaker. Three zip caps as Kolzig makes 38 saves for his first career playoff shutout. The Bruins are shut out in the playoffs for the first time since 1992. The Caps now lead it 3-1. to one. It doesn't get much better than this. The National Hockey League playoffs return to TSN on Wednesday as the Philadelphia Flyers try to find themselves. Dominated in game number three, Philly trails two games to one. Immediately following that contest, we will take you to Los Angeles as the Kings are in danger of being swept by St. Louis. The Chicago Blackhawks made Craig... It, live it, TSN. The hits just keep coming on this edition of the desk as Yager and the Pens finally break free against the Habs. The Blues trying to get a grip on a sweep of the Kings. Lindros tries to let his fist do the talking, but Barnaby turns from slugger to sniper for the Sabres. The Oilers look to Cujo for answers in Denver, while Akeem and the Rockets try to play a tune on the Jazz. Jordan is Jordan as the Bulls look to silence the Nets. Henkin is horrible as the Jays get a crown him from the Royals, and they're at the post for post positions in Saturday's Kentucky Derby. For some soothing highlights, the show that really knocks you off your seat, and hey, we're ready to take requests. TSN Sports Desk is coming up next. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the desk. One week ago, the Stanley Cup playoffs began, and if we have learned anything, it's expect the unexpected. I'm Darren Detition. Glad you tuned in. And I'm Dave Randolph in Vancouver, and you're right, Dutch. It was a pivotal game for on three different fronts Wednesday night. You had the Habs trying to take a stranglehold against the Penguins in Montreal, right? Yeah, desperation generally breeds good hockey, and with their series lying in the balance, the Pittsburgh Penguins were a desperate club. Down two games to one and in Montreal, Kevin Constantine's team knew the time was now. They had to win game number four or face a quick trip out of the playoffs. Now the Pens come out gunning just over three minutes in. Yuri Slager with the shot through traffic. It's tipped by Robbie Brown. It's one up in Pens. It's a power play goal. A minute and a half later, Vinny Damfus holding on to Yager. He gets two. Pens in the power play. Hatcher with the blast. It's two zip. If Kevin Hatcher was a ball player, he'd be up for the season. The Habs get one back, but then Brian Savage is drilled by Brad Warenka. Savage leaves us with a concussion. The Pens come back. Another power play. Yager and Francis, we're going to give and go. It's 3-1. to one. Less than 30 seconds left in the period. Pittsburgh shorthanded. Eddie Olchek on the breakaway. Five hole on Moog. It's 4-1 Pens after one. Three minutes into the second, Montreal power play. Kintel coughs it up. Martin Strack is off. He goes shelf. That's a great shot. Another shorthanded goal. It's 5-1. That's all for Moog. In comes Jose Theodore. Penguins dominating everywhere. Darius Kasparaitis absolutely levels. Jonas Hoagland, less than two minutes into the third. Turner Stevenson feeds Mark Biro. That makes it 5-2. The Habs continue to press. Tom Barrasso draws the penalty on course, and the Penguins, they may be playing dead, but they're alive in this series with a 6-3 victory. Ron Francis had three assists for the Penguins. The Pens scored five special team goals, three on the power play, two shorthanded, and Vinny Dampu said it was over early. Right in the first period, uh, they scored, I think, uh, three power play, one shorthanded, and uh, made the difference. Special team won the game for us in the, the third game, first game, the most in center, and tonight it was the opposite. Special teams were obviously a key tonight for us, and, uh, you know, they have been all year. We've been struggling so far in the series, but tonight the power play was there to generate some goals, and, uh, you know, anytime you can get production from your penalty, that's a big bonus for us, and, uh, you know, help win us a hockey game. 
Well, the LA Kings played a pretty solid 57 minutes against the Blues on Monday night. Uh, too bad about those other three minutes in the third, right? You've seen the highlights by now. Four goals over a span of three minutes and seven seconds on a five-minute major power play. Blues won it 4-3, and they had the brooms out on Wednesday looking for the sweep, and Jamie Storr suffering from post-concussion syndrome, so Fassay gets the start. He was shredded in game one, and he was tested early in this one. Steve Duchesne with a nice move, but Fassett the save. And then on the play, Jeff Cornell gets a little payback here from Rob Blake after that wicked blow on store. Second period, Kings work it out to Luke Robitaille, point blank, but Greg Fuhrer has been very solid in this series. Then the Blues send it down the ice. Fassett comes way out to play it, misses the puck. There's Duchesne, can't recover for the gimme. Close call. Third period, one nothing Blues. Here's the killer here. Conroy over the line, takes a shot from a weak angle and gets one to go off the knob and in. That hurts. 2 nothing St. Louis, but the Kings battle back. Aki Berg tees it up. The rebound to Joseph Stumpel gets his first of the series. 2-1. Then Kings pressing. The point shot redirected by Glenn Murray. The puck goes in. The light goes on. The ref says no. The ref said I blew the whistle before it crossed the line, which it did. Larry Robinson's thinking, I have seen it all now in this series, and he'll be seeing it all on TV from here on out because the Blues win it. The Kings are done. Grant Fuhr makes 34 saves as the St. Louis Blues win game four and sweep the series in four straight. But you know what? Even in defeat, Larry Robinson wasn't going to point the finger at the referee. He was classy. Officiating is a hell of a tough job, and I'm not, I'm not going to say it's an easy job. And, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can pick them apart every game and say they should have done this and should have called that. And uh, uh, so I'm not going to start now. Both games are disappointing. I mean... I really believe that goal was in. So, uh, you know, you work this hard, and you got, you know, you got to work for every inch you get. And it's too bad they can't ask for another second opinion because uh, from where we were and from the replay, that goal was in. And it's 2-2. We'd still be playing right now. The Buffalo Sabres boast the best goalie in the National Hockey League. We all know that. But after Dominic Hasek, they don't have what you would call a marquee player. But as a team, they are formidable indeed. Through the first three games of their series with the Flyers, Lindy Ruff has ruled out four lines and six defensemen. Roger Nielsen has been forced to go with some eight forwards and five defensemen. His team just can't keep up. John LeClaire and Eric Lindros... They don't want to be embarrassed in back-to-back -back games. First period, Alexi Zhitna goes after the Big E, but Lindros not phased. The Flyers try to get an early jump. Mike Sillinger, he's got a great chance, but Hasek denies him. Meanwhile, Sean Burt gets the nod. That's Bobby Clark's decision. And the Sabres threat, Mike Pekka gets it out front to Dixon Ward. It's 1-0 Buffalo, still in the first. Buffalo power play, Brian Holzinger, the mere slap shake tap. He beats Burke. The fans go wild at Marine Midland. It's two zip Buffalo. Second period, Matthew Barnaby gets hauled down by Spoboda, but Barnaby gets up and deposits his first. It's three zip Sabres, and Ronnie Hextall remains on the bench. Then the Flyers' defense disappears. Holzinger, he walks in, pots the Sabres' third power play marker. They are absolutely smoking. It's 4 nothing Buffalo all game. The fans were on Lindros, and the Big E tries to take things into his own hands. Mike Wilson on the receiving end. The fans continue to give Lindros a hard time as Philly appears to be headed for the links. 4-1 to is the final. Dominic Hasek, 44 saves as the Flyers outshot the Sabres, 45-20. to The Flyers were 0-6 for in the power play. They're now 2-28 for in the series. The Sabres are 6-22. for Now, Philadelphia didn't show up, including their goaltending. It's frustrating. Uh, you know, the guys played well. We, we had some chances, and then... Uh, they capitalize on the couple chances they have, so it's frustrating. The desperation's got to push through and make us uh, and force us actually to uh, to uh, go as hard as we can. We got to bring everything to the table next game. Otherwise, it's going to be a long summer where we got to have no one to blame but ourselves and uh, look in the mirror at. Uh, you know, we really have it. We have one more chance here to get things going, and then uh, and then you build off that. Of course, it's great to see. You know, my teammates score so many goals and uh, and play such a great game at least for the first uh, 30 minutes you know it's it takes the pressure from me you know and once we were up four goals it's 
it's almost the fun to play, you know, like you don't, uh, it's, you know, even if you give up one or two goals, nothing can happen. And coming up, the mailman was ready to deliver for the Jack. Keeping the dream alive leads to seven nights of genuine sudden death. The Stanley Cup Playoffs. See it, live it, TSN. Ahead on the desk, the Avs try to bury the Oilers for good while the Devils are looking for an afterlife against the Sens. Fedorov tries to put the wings in flight against the Coyotes while things are getting nasty between the Sharks and the Stars. The T-Wolves are hungry for a sonic boom against Seattle while the Heat and the Knicks are fighting again. Guzman is out of control as the Jays face the Royals while Griffey is dialing long D against the Yankees. The Ruffies get Reggie some slack as they give him a new deal, having a bad hair day or having a bad face day. Hey, wake up or we'll tell your teacher the desk is next. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the desk of the National Hockey League playoffs continues. So where else can we begin? I'm Darren Detition. We're glad you tuned in. And I'm Dave Randorf in Vancouver. Dave, the scenario was quite simple for the Edmonton Oilers, and that was win. Nothing else but win. Yeah, that's right. You know, things have gotten so bad for the Edmonton Oilers lately, falling down 3-1. Some were even suggesting uh, benching Curtis Joseph. Uh, true, he had not exactly stood on his head to this point in the series, but you go with Bratcher, right? Dutch, you know that. And Cujo was quite capable of bringing the Oilers back to Edmonton for a Game 6 in this series. But first, he had to get past Game 5. He had to steal one, which he has not done yet in this series, but he was ready for this one. First period, Kaminsky gets the shot off. Cujo the save. Rebound to Ozilinch. Cujo the save. But later in the period, Avalanche on a delayed penalty, and the Oilers seem to pause here. Fitzgerald to step on yeah, look out, it's a breakaway. He moves right in and scores. one nothing Avalanche after one. And second period, Cujo was getting some help here. Uwe Krupp's point shot goes off of both posts and out. It stayed one nothing through two. So it was simple for the Oilers. They needed two in the third at least, or it was over. Early in the third, they get a power play. Ryan Smith is going to be stopped by Patrick Owah, but the big rebound is blasted home by Bill Guerin. We're tied at one. Then later in the period, some great work behind the net by Zelapukin and Greer. Greer throws it in front and somehow gets it to go. There's the two goals. Oilers lead by one, and Cujo remains solid. Krupp's shot is stopped. The rebound, Dead Marsh can't find it. Then left about a minute left. Colorado was all over them. They clear the puck, but Rawa was headed to the bench, doesn't play it, thinking that's going to be icing. No, sir. Great work by Greer, who beats Krupp off the puck and then tucks it home for a great empty netter, and that seals the deal. Edmonton will play another day back at home on Saturday night after a 3-1 win in Denver. As for Cujo, makes 30 saves, looking pretty steady for the Oilers. Patrick Owa also made 30 stops, but he was denied the 100th playoff win of his career. As mentioned, Game 6 is Saturday in Edmonton, and that's because these guys played like they had nothing to lose. You get backed in a corner a little bit, and uh, um, you know you come out swinging, and I think we did that, and um, you know may have, may have been the fifth game uh, for them, but uh, it was the seventh game for us. I knew they were going to play well today, and not give it, give, giving us anything. I mean, they had to go back in and out, and they probably wanted to go uh, with us. I think everyone's a little more, just a little bit more intense out there, and uh, it may be bearing down a little bit. It's uh, it's do or die every game out here, so you're just going out there and you're just giving it all, and you don't want to let your teammates down, so. Every shift, you're just playing as hard as you can. The Coliseum's going to be rocking. Now, motivation can come in many forms, but perhaps the best is fear itself. Fighting for their playoff lives, the New Jersey Devils returned home. Their 48 victories and 107 regular season points, a distant memory, determined to extend this series. They had to prove themselves on the ice because this was bigger than a hockey game. This was elimination. Damian Rhodes can backstop the Senators to their first modern-day playoff series victory. Right away, Sean Van Allen sets the tone. He cranks Brendan Morrison, but the Devils get the man advantage. Morrison feeds Dougie Gilmore off the pipe. Later in the first, Sands press back the crossbow. Spots Chris Phillips. He hits the iron. Then Van Allen wreaks more havoc. Dave Andrichuk, he retaliates. He gets the gate. Ensuing Senators' power play. 
Mark Tambrador with a great play. He outlets it off the glass. Brian Rolston turns on the Jets. He goes to the backhander, a shorthanded goal. It's 1-0, Jersey, second period. Sands look to pull even. Magnus Arvidsson sent it all alone. Brodeur gets a piece of it. Then on a devil's man advantage, Lyle Odeline with a shot. It goes off Phillipson in. It's two-zip Jersey. Then late in the second, Bruce Gardner denied by the poke check. Midway through the third, Ottawa keeps pressing. Igor Kravchuk. Finally beats Brodeur. That's his first. That makes it two to one for the Devils. But just over a minute later, Dougie Gilmore left all alone. That's a killer for the Senators. New Jersey lives to fight another day as the Devils force game six with a 3-1 victory. Martin Brodeur made 22 saves. He also had an assist on Wollstone's goal. Game six goes Saturday night in Ottawa for the Devils. The difference was jumping out to that two nothing lead. When you, you get goals, uh, the attitude change, and you can see it on, on, the, uh, on the bench. The guys, they go on the ice, they feel good, they, they feel better. They feel to play and have fun. I try not to stay tight, nervous, but uh, again, just focus to the point that we knew what we had to do. The game's over with now. Uh, we're going to learn from this game, and we're going to regroup ourselves and, uh, you know, we, got, we, we still got the lead, so I mean, we've got to keep our head, uh, our confidence with us, and uh, we'll go to the next game and uh, try and win it then. Elsewhere, they had the Octopi ready to go in Detroit. Game five between the Coyotes and the Red Wings, and with Nikolai Abbey Bullen out with that groin injury, Jimmy Waite gets the starts for Phoenix. And in the first, Waite was tested early. Fedorov to Kozlov for a quick one-timer, but Waite gets him with the big save. Unfortunately for him, his team lets him down here with a bad clearing attempt. Kozlov is eventually going to tee this one up. Holstrom got a piece on the way through, and it's one nothing Detroit. Pocket tied it at one, but Detroit comes right back. Kozlov again has that Coyotes D all turned around, and Slava snaps it top shelf, far side, 2-1 after one. And just one minute into the second, one minute in, Phoenix is in trouble again. Fedorov cuts in front, makes a nice little move, and scores. 3-1 wings. And things get a little testy here as Darren McCarty drives Norm McIver head first ugh, into the boards. No call, even though over on that Coyotes bench, uh, Jim Schoenfeld had a call or two, and he had a thing to say about that. Uh, this series has been nasty. A lot of bad blood in this one. Roenick drills McCarty for a little payback there. Then Brendan Shanahan, look at this hit on Tever Dosky. That's a good clean hit right there. But up on the scoreboard where it counted, it was 3-1 final. After falling behind, Detroit has regained the lead in this series, and they are in the driver's seat. Holstrom and Kozlov each have a goal and an assist. Phoenix was outshot 27-18. to Wings lead the series 3-2, to but Chris Draper says they are not going to get caught taking Phoenix lightly. They're a dangerous hockey club when they can uh, wheel through the neutral zone, build up some speed. You know, guys like Rona Kachuk, you know, a playmaker like Craig Janney, you know, those guys thrive on time, and that's something that we want to take away from them. And, uh, you know, the last couple games we've been able to do that. Home is where the heart is for both the San Jose Sharks and the Dallas Stars. So far, it works like this. If you're at home, you win. Dallas was hoping the trend would continue. The Stars, Craig Ludwig, putting Sean Burr on his wallet. and Welcome to Texas. Burr then tries to retaliate by cutting Brian Scrudlin in half. It didn't work. Dallas would hit pay dirt with 10 minutes remaining in the period. The loose puck ends up in front. Mike Medano scores. It's 1-0 for the Stars, but the second period paints a different picture. San Jose with a man advantage. Some nice passing. John McClain to Bernie Nichols. Back to McClain. We're all tied up. Then only eight seconds later, Ron Sutter with a great steal. He lets it go just like that. It's 2-1 Sharks, but the Stars fight back. Tied it to in the third. Daryl Sador hits Mike Medano, cutting through the slot. But Mike Vernon wants him to go upstairs to check if Jamie Langenbrunner was in the crease. Was he or wasn't he? It does not matter. Kerry Fraser lets the goal stand. The Sharks bench is furious. That proved to be the winner as Dallas takes a bite out of San Jose. The three to two the final. Mike Medano's first period goal snapped Mike Vernon's shutout streak of 142 minutes. Jamie Langenbrunner had two assists for the Stars. Game six will go Saturday night in San Jose afterwards. Mike Vernon was extremely upset with a game-winning goal.
they'll slap his wrist maybe and say that maybe it was a bad call or uh, maybe next time or whatever. But as a result, those Sharks are down now. In a playoff game, that was it was very important. We haven't won in this building, and uh, we're 2-2 going into the third period. That's probably the best game we've uh, we've had in here uh, since the playoffs. And, uh, you know, it was, carpet was pulled right from underneath our feet. Up next on the Daz Porter, and the Team Wolves are on target against the... For Saturday with Graham Leggett, only on TSN. On the desk, the Habs are road warriors against the Penguins. Push comes to shove as the Sabres try to ground the Flyers. Allison and the Bruins go for gold against goalie to goalie. The Oilers are still alive and playing ping pong in Edmonton. While the Senators hope some home cook and get some past the Devils. The Rockets and the Jazz go head to head in game four. Tyson Holyfield it wasn't, but the NBA still hands out suspensions. Andrews and the Expos dial long distance against the Diamondbacks. It's an uphill battle for the Mariners against the Tigers. While well, Donco Jones is in the swing of things at the LPGA Title Holders Championship. Indian Charlie leads the field in Saturday's run for the Roses. Hey, we've got all the highlights covered. Sports Desk is guaranteed to blow you away, and it's coming up next. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the desk. Heated is the best way to describe the playoffs as two more teams who are facing elimination. I'm Darren Detishin. Glad you tuned in. And I'm Dave Randorf in Vancouver. And Dutch, those Montreal Canadiens and the Pittsburgh Penguins, they've been trading them back and forth. Game five back in Pittsburgh on Friday night, right? And that is exactly where we will begin. Almost even in their ability, there is very little to choose from between the Montreal Canadiens and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Reduced to a best of three with two victories apiece, this has become a battle of wills. And one had to wonder about the halves with Stefan Kintel and Brian Savage out due to injury. Would it tip the scales in favor of the Pens? Well, Montreal counters with Saku Koivu. He's back in the lineup. First period, Koivu. How's the hand? Wires a bullet. Tommy Barrasso makes a save. Later, the halves at it again. Vladimir Malikov to Mark Recchi. Barrasso. Looking good. Darius Kasparaitis up to his old tricks on Turner Stevenson at the other end. Alex Hicks centers to Robert Long, but Andy Moog equal to the task. Then Hicks is sent in all alone. Big save, Moog. It's scoreless after one period. The injury bug continues for Montreal. Scott Thornton gets butt-ended in the face. He's taken off the ice. Seconds later, Kevin Hatcher. Rubs Benoit Brunet into the boards. He's shaken up. He'd go to the dressing room. But the Habs won't be intimidated. Vinny Dampu centers the puck. Patrice Brisebois fires home the rebound. Montreal's up one to nothing. Scott Thornton back in the game, but he's got the shiner. Montreal keeps coming. Mark Recchi leaves it for Shane Corson. His shot finds the twine. It's two zip Canadians. First minute of the third period. Koivu wheeling in the pen's end. The perfect pass to Recchi. He scores its three zip. Now the Penguins make it 3 1. Less than seven minutes to go. Ron Francis back to Yager. He fires a missile by Andy Moog. It's 3 2 Habs. Moog was shaken up on the play, but he stays in the game. The Pens. They keep pressing. Less than two minutes to go. Igor Ulanov headmans it. Vinny Dampus in all along. Dampus, sweet move. He scores. The Habs bench erupts. They add an empty netter. They go on to win at 5-2. to two. Saku Koivu, one assist in his return. What a gritty game for the Montreal Canadiens. Now, the last time Pittsburgh lost a game five at home, to fall behind 3-2, to two, they rallied to win. Not only the series, but the Stanley Cup, that was in 1991. Afterwards, the Habs were pretty relieved after what was a scary third period. That was uh, a pretty exciting finish. It's not the way we wanted it, but, uh, you know, we sat back and they came on strong and, you know, it was another great game and, and so far a great series. Obviously, we're going to be down a little depressed tonight after the game, but uh, starting tomorrow, we got to start getting positive again. Uh, they have to win four to win a series. We're not giving up. Uh, it's going to take a while to, to get over this one, but we have all night to do that. And starting tomorrow, our whole focus is on game six and winning that one. When it gets to the Stanley Cup playoffs, everything is magnified, and that's a good thing because you've needed a high-powered microscope to find Eric Lindros lately. 
The so-called big fella didn't even register a shot in Game 4 as the Sabres took a 3-1 series lead and went looking to wrap this thing up in Philly on Friday night. But even with that hole to climb out of, the Flyer fans were talking a talk. Matthew Barnaby was a pest right off the bat. He takes Lindros and the elbow that comes with it for an early power play. Sabres have scored timely goals with a man advantage, and they do it again. Jason Woolley's shot squeezes through pads of Sean Burke, and it's 1-0 Sabres. Was it going to be another long night for Roger Nielsen? Not if they stuck to his plan, which was get to Hashik, throw him off his game, somehow run into him, and they did, like Sean Podine right there, rattling his cage a bit, and maybe it worked. Dag is going to find, Alexander Dag is going to find Mike Sillinger playing very well for these Flyers. And there you go. He goes high and makes it a 1-1. But the Sabres apply more pressure. Dave Babbage with a tough giveaway. Michael Groshek in alone. Great move. But Sean Burke with a better save while the Flyers keep the pressure on Hashik. Leclerc gives him a bit of a bump back to the net. Sabres scored again on the power play to lead 2-1. But Flyers with the man advantage here. And it's Babbage from the point. Another high shot, 2-2. We're late in the third now. And look out, because here comes Barnaby, Barnaby with a breakaway from center ice, but uh, I don't think that one worked out the way he wanted. He barely got a shot away. It goes to OT. In overtime, Grattan gets the stick up in the face of Barnaby. He gets the gate. Another Buffalo power play, and guess what? Groshek in front, hits the post, gets the rebound, and that is it. The Sabres win it in overtime, 3-2. Another flop for Eric Lindros in Philly, and Bobby Clark has got to sit and ponder for another very long summer. Eight of Buffalo's last 13 goals in this series came on the power play. And how about Michael Groshek? His seventh career playoff goal, all of them against the Flyers. And afterwards, Donald Daudet was among the happy Buffalo Sabres, happy to be moving on and happy to beat this team. We've been battling against them for three, uh, three series, and it's the first time we beat them. So uh, it's a good feeling in this, uh, this hockey room. Uh, you know, it was a great uh, victory and a, a great series. I think the players realized after the first two months that, boy, it would be a sad pitcher at the end of the year with a, a goaltender that's the league MVP if you're not in the playoff scene. And we, we tried to make that point uh, day in, day out, and uh, we grew and came together. The main difference was the... Uh the power plays. We we had the chances, but we couldn't get the puck in the net. Uh, they uh, they were able to score on their on their power plays. And uh, you know, three last game, three tonight. I mean, you can't allow those kind of uh, uh, you can't allow goals like that. You know, six power play goals in two games and expect to win. But I thought you know, outside of the penalty killing, we probably played as well as we could play tonight. It is almost a yearly rite of spring. The Washington Capitals enter the playoffs with high expectations, only to watch their hopes disappear in the first round. In 95, they led three games to one and lost. In 93, they were up 2 nothing and lost. In 92, they led 3-1 to one and lost. In 87, they led 3-1 to one and, yeah, they lost. Up a very fortunate three games to one on the Boston Bruins. The Capitals were in a position to close them out, but the overriding question remained, could they get it done? Olaf Kolzig has been near unbeatable in this series, stopping 154 of 160 shots. Game gets off to a chippy start. Check out Chris Simon. He takes a hack at Jason Allison. Pat Burns is absolutely livid. No penalty for Simon. Referee Rob Schick missed a play. Allison with some words for the Caps bench. He was all right. Byron Defoe keeping the Bruins in the game early on. Kelly Miller cuts across the crease. Defoe cuts him off. Nice save. Later, Joey Juno rips his shot. Defoe can't get a handle on it. It bounces off his head. He finally sprawls and covers up. Second period, Allison and Sergei Samsonov go to work. Allison carries it in, makes a pretty move. Over to Samson off. He beats Kolzig. That makes it one to nothing. Boston. Five and a half minutes later, the two hook up again on the power play. Samson off this time returns the favor. He feeds Allison, who puts it by Kolzig. It's two zip. Ronnie Wilson not impressed with the turn of events. The Bruins then strike again late in the period. Rob DeMaio with Mark Tamorty on him gets the wraparound to go. It's three nothing. Bees. The Bruins add another in the third. The Caps reliving a nightmare. Perhaps the Bruins shut them out. Four zip. They're going back to Beantown. Defoe, 26 saves for his first career playoff shutout. The Bruins pick up their first road playoff shutout since 1976. The difference, Byron Defoe, he was a rock. 
My job is just to give our team a chance to win every night. I mean, I, I, I get enough press throughout the season. I can, uh, I can handle taking a break as long as we win these hockey games. And, uh, you know, our back was against the wall tonight, and uh, we responded. But uh, by no means are we uh, happy or satisfied. We've, uh, we've got still a long road ahead of us. It was a big game, and, you know, we, you know, Sergey played awesome too tonight, and uh, we clicked together. And uh, Dimitri, like you know, little did a bunch of little things that you know go unnoticed that helped us get both those goals. And uh, you know, as a you know, our team played great too. Well, you can't beat the NHL playoffs, and they return to TSN on Saturday as the Dallas Stars are in San Jose. The Stars lead the series in three games to two, but have yet to win on the road. This has been an outstanding battle. All the action begins at nine o'clock Eastern time. That's six o'clock Pacific time. In the meantime, the World Hockey Championships began on Friday in Zurich, and Canada started well. Keith Prima, who is wearing the C for Canada, had a goal along with Ray Whitney, Eric Daze, Gord Murphy, and Brian McCabe in a 5-1 win over Austria. Next up for the good guys is Slovakia on Sunday, and as always, TSN will bring you coverage from the World Championships. Ahead on this tasty edition of TSN Sports Desk. Could the Senators drop the Devils in Game 6? In Cujo, they trust as the Oilers try to stay alive. Modano and the Stars hope they don't let the Sharks off the hook. Neil Quiet speaks real loud of the Kentucky Derby. Carl of the Sonics looking for a little help against the T-Wolves. Hi there! Lori Kane is fighting for the lead of the title holders championship. The Rockets great as straight A's against Oakland. Guerrero is dialing long distance for the Expos, while Junior is growling against the Tigers. So you want to be a mascot, eh? No, it's not all fun and games. You may not get treated all that well, but we won't leave you hanging. Sports Desk is next. The Senators are putting on the show of these playoffs so far, and the Oilers are doing everything they can to preserve the moniker as the Cardiac Kids. A couple of great stories to lead off our show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Gino Retta. And I'm David Pratt. You know, Gino, the stage was set. Was it ever? Ottawa was in a position to pull off another major upset by eliminating the Devils and winning their first playoff series in the modern era of that franchise. Yeah, you know, David, the Senators finished eighth in the East, 24 points behind the Devils, who finished first. Martin Brodeur had the best goals against average in the entire league. Rhodes was way back, almost a half goal a game worse. Add it all up, and it means absolutely nothing. You can talk all you want about who has a better team on paper, but they don't play these games on paper. Rhodes has been stellar. He has allowed just 10 goals in the series, posting a 934 save percentage. Look sharp early. Dave Anderchuk to Peter Sikora. Rhodes makes a save. Rebound of Doug Gilmore saves that as well. That of the Corral Center crowd rocking and Gilmore shaking his head. Later, sends on the power play. Daniel Alfredson to Alexa Yashin. He moves out in front, beats Martin Brodeur. 1-0 sends after one. And Jacques Lemaire has that uneasy pass me the Pepto type feeling. Second period, Sands are buzzing the Devil's End. Scott Niedermeyer gets the double whammy. Denny Lambert and Stan Netzcash send them flying, but the Devils get on the board. Kevin Dean's point shot bounces through the traffic, beats Rhodes. A CNI goal, game tied at one. A few minutes later, the Sens jump back on top. Yanni Lockenen's point shot somehow gets through and beats Rhodes. Beats Brodeur, rather. Brodeur's fuming. Let's take another look, see what he's upset about. Sean McEachern knocks into Brodeur's stick and knocks it out of his hands. Brodeur complains to Kelly Fraser, but to no avail. Two to one sends after two. Lemaire and the Devils, a period away from elimination. The Devils going all out in the third. Patrick Elias, shot stop. Gilmore, shot turned away as well. And instead of sitting on the lead, the Sens keep on pushing. Alfredson in tight, he has stopped. Yashin has stopped as well. Finally, with 49 seconds left to go in regulation, and Martin Brodeur on the bench, the Sens break out two on one. Sean Van Allen wisely gets to Igor Kravchuk, scores into the empty net, and it is party time in Ottawa. Alexei Yashin and the Senators are going to the next round. What a huge victory, a huge series. Three to one, your final score. With that, New Jersey is done. Ottawa is going on. So, where do the Sens go from here? If the Penguins win their series of the Habs, Ottawa faces Pittsburgh. If not, then the Senators face the winner in the Capitals Bruins series in the next round of the playoffs. Our Mark Bunting was at the Corral Center and has more in this report. 
The students beat the mentors at their own game. The older, more experienced Devils were supposed to teach the younger, eager Senators a lesson. But Ottawa decided it was ready now to graduate to the next level. Defeating a heavy favorite makes this victory even more gratifying. Yeah, I liked it when you guys were saying we should lose, and hopefully we'll talk about it next series, too, that we should lose. And, uh... You know, and Jacques, Jacques Lemaire talked about how we should lose too, and that, that really pumped us up too. He didn't give us much respect. It was a, a great team effort. We were down to 5D there for a period and a half, short bench, and the forwards did a great job by getting the puck in deep. I mean, we, it was an easy third period for us. We played in there and most of the night, and if we were in our end, we got it out quickly. And I'll give Ottawa credit. They, uh, from from 1 through 20 as a team, they they played as good as they could play. There's no question. Uh, you know, I don't think they can play much better hockey, and, and our club probably played 60% of our capacity, so it's tough to win like that. And they played well. They, uh, I'm not going to say they're a better team, but obviously uh, they won, so that makes them a better team at this point. Entering the series, Damian Rhodes was deemed vastly inferior to Martin Brodeur because of a lack of playoff experience and a perceived flakiness. After six mostly stellar games, Rhodes has forged a brand new reputation for himself. He really, really wanted it. and He wanted it for himself, he wanted it for the team, he wanted it for the fans, he wanted it. And anytime you have an individual that wanted it you know, so bad like Damian did, uh, I'm just real happy for him. He deserves all the credit he got. It's, it's so hard to believe. I remember uh, telling my wife, uh, before the series started, you know, I, I don't think she was expecting that much out, out of us in the first round. And uh, we've played New Jersey tough all year. And hey, you just never know. I'm just going to go out there and, and see what happens. As for the Devils, they cruised down the stretch, and it cost them in the playoffs. I felt that uh, what went wrong is we, uh, you know, we didn't prepare towards the end of the season. We didn't prepare for the playoff as well. You know, by working hard and try to win games and try to to have it a solid team. Another area where the Senators excelled was in their penalty killing. The Devils had the second best power play during the regular season, but the Senators wound up killing off 20 of 23. Ottawa is on a roll right now, and it's going to give anybody trouble in the second round, no matter who they play. Mark Bunting, TSN in Ottawa. The last time the Oilers were down three games to one in a series was 1990. That year, the Oilers not only came back to beat the Jets, they went on to win the Stanley Cup. Thursday, the Edmonton Oilers took the first step back. Saturday night, they needed to take yet another. And the Oilers fans putting their faith in Joseph. Colorado trying to get to him early. Warren Reichel getting up real close and personal there. The Oilers get on board first, though. Just over three minutes in, Doug Waite drops for Barahowski, and that made it 1-0 for Edmonton early. And the Oilers keep pressing. Tony Herkus stopped by Oa. Miller makes a great play to get the rebound out of there. Oilers fans wearing some quality headgear in this one. Who is that guy? Early in the second, Cujo makes the stop on Ozilinch. Kamensky pops it in right there. But hold, hold on, time out. They go upstairs. Kamensky skate, watch for it here. Just on the edge of the crease. No goal. No goal. Peter Forsberg just a little frustrated. He takes it out on Frank Seal. Ouch, that's got a smart. Near the end of the second, Cujo gets cut way out of position. Ozilinch will try to center it out there, but Hammerlick makes a great play. Still 1-0 after two periods. Let's get on to the third. Cujo comes up with a big stop on Ozilinch right there. Then midway through the third on the Oilers' power play. Doug Waite, great little pass to Boris Marinov. He goes top shelf. That made it 2-0. Then Cujo gets to work, keeps it going. He stops Keith Jones right here again. And again, and again, wow. At the end of the game, watch this Ron Lowe, not very happy with Mark Crawford because he was trying to start something, putting some goons on the ice, that sort of stuff. The Oilers hang in there, they win it. The final is 2-0, despite all the antics that wrapped up the game. You better believe the Oilers were still pretty happy. It was Cujo's fifth career playoff shutout, and Doug Waite picked up two assists for those who have him in their pool, and we'll have a complete report a little bit later on in the show. And you know, David, this time last year, the Oilers were wrapping up a first-round upset over the Dallas Stars. The Stars were up three games to two before getting knocked out. Saturday night, the Stars were up three games to two over the Sharks. And you got to believe they were thinking, get this baby wrapped up before falling victim to old habits. Ed Belfort received a match penalty in game three, but no disciplinary action taken against him, so the fans have a different opinion as to who's up 3-2. First period, Sharks on a power play, Murray Craven, great between the legs pass, goes off Joe Murphy, skate and in. They go upstairs, it stands. One of the Sharks, Sharks get another break. Reverse angle, Mike Ricci pokes down Mike Madano, no call. Mike Ricci keeps on moving, moves it on, Belfort, great goal. 
Two nothing Sharks in the second. Stars respond. Brian Scrudlin, great clean face off. Richard Matmachuk point shot beats Mike Vernon. Two to one. Minutes later, another Shark power play. Watch Mike Medano. Takes it up ice. Great pass to Mike Keane. A shorthanded goal. Stars tied at two after two. Darian Hatcher chasing down an icing. Nailed by Owen Nolan. No call. The icing is waved off. Late third period, the Stars press for the go-ahead goal scramble. Mike Vernon is down. It sneaks through but hits the post. Then it's Sergei Zubov. The big blast on the point. Vernon with the glove save. We're headed to overtime. Mike Keenan, oh, in this, the first five games of the series, not a single goal. Already has a tying goal in this game. Early in OT, Mike Keenan on the rush. Dishes to Daryl Sador. A beauty give and go. Keenan waits, scores. Mike Keen and the Dallas Stars defeat the Sharks 3-2. Your final score with that, it is over. The Sharks are done. The Dallas Stars will advance to the second round for the first time since 1994. And according to Sharks coach Daryl Sutter, the Sharks' downfall was the early part of this series. You're down 2-0 to the team that had the best record in the league, and you got to win four of the next five, and that's going to be damn tough. And, and uh, you know there's going to be mistakes and, and errors along the way in those five games if you get to go the five. And, and you know, you just, we just weren't able to sustain it at all. There's a tremendous feeling of relief in our dressing room, and uh, I know one thing will be awful tough to play against for the balance of the playoffs. Just a reminder that TSN is the place to be for NHL playoff action Sunday afternoon. It's game six between the Wings and Coyotes. But if any chance to be looking to end the series, leading three games to two, game time is noon Pacific. That's 3 o'clock Eastern. All right, David, time for a break. When we come back, Real Quiet was looking to make some real big noise at the Kentucky Derby. Would it be? See it. Live it. TSN. Ahead on this bone-jarring edition of Sports Desk, the Canadians put the Penguins in a tight spot in Game 6. The Coyotes reduced to a whimper by the Wings in Phoenix. Oates and the Caps try to chop down the Bruins in Boston. Hide the women and children. The Oilers and Avs get ready for Game 7. The Jazz ready to rock the rim against the Rockets. While you-know-who puts the sting on the Hornets. Could Laurie Kane grab the title at the title holders championship? Hermanson delivers for the Expos against the D-backs. We're running through the walls for you. Looking for all the thrills and the spills from the day in sports. Things are just ducky on this edition of Sports Desk. The Senators had already advanced, and another Canadian team was in position to do the same Sunday as round one of the Stanley Cup playoffs continued. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Rod Smith. And I'm David Pratt. You know, Rod, the last time, the last time the Montreal Canadiens actually won a playoff series was 1993, five long years ago, when they beat the L.A. Kings in the Stanley Cup final. Yes, David, and that season... The Habs, uh, really, they made their own breaks and took advantage of a few upsets along the way to go the distance. Sunday night at the Molson Center, the Canadians had a chance to end the drought, leading Pittsburgh three games to two, heading into game number six. Here we go, Brian Savage, back in the Habs lineup after a concussion in game four. Scary moment for the Habs in the first. Saku Koivu aggravates that uh, broken hand of his and leaves briefly, but he does stay in the game. Yaramir Yager can't get much going. Good chance in front, but puts it on the side of the net. Can't that put can't. it in. Penn's that power play. Kevin Atcher, nice move. Andy Moog with a nice stop, and it's scoreless after one. Midway through the second, Shane Corson feeding Koivu the shot. And Mark Recchi pops in the rebound. Our first goal of the game. It is a biggie. one nothing halves, and they keep coming. Koivu, the wraparound chance. By the time he gets the shot away, it goes to the side of the net. Jonas Hoagland, though, thinks he'll give it a try and has more success, beating Tom Barrasso right there to make it 2-0. And that counts even though you see Turner Stevenson is in the crease. And they used to say no goal and that sort of thing, but 2-zip Montreal. Third period, Yager, head down. Stevenson lowers the boom. A little slow to get up is Yager. Habs power play, Vladimir Malakoff the shot, the rebound to Koivu. 3-0 Montreal, they can smell it. Penguins can't buy a goal. It's been story much through the series there. Yarmer Yager can't maintain control. And Andy Moog holds the fort for the shutout. And a 3-0 final for the Canadians. Handshakes all around. They are moving on to round two, advancing 
in a playoff series for the first time since 1993, the year they last won the Stanley Cup. And uh, Moog stopped 21 shots, recording his fourth career playoff shutout, his first since 1992. But even Moog says, hey, it wasn't just me that beat the Penguins. We deserve this one for full marks, guys. Uh, we really earned it the first, uh, you know, 40 minutes. We established a lead. We really took them out of their play. Uh, we continued to be physical the entire night, and that really disrupted their flow. It was great. Uh, the whole series, he played uh, extremely well. He made some big, big saves for us tonight, and uh, throughout the series, he came through big time. And, uh, you know, he's very excited. He's like a young kid over there. I really think our team believed we had a good chance. So they scored the key first goal halfway through each of the last two games when in fact in either of those games we could have taken the one nothing lead and, and it could have changed when they had the lead you know we never had a chance to tie the game because they were so big and they played very good defense and they were just better physically i think they were better than us michael whalen will be back a little bit later on in the show and have a full report for us you know you can change the name the city and the players but a curse well that's a tough thing to lose. Winnipeg Jets or Phoenix Coyotes, in the last 11 years, the franchise had made it to the playoffs six times and lost in the first round six times. Sunday, Detroit was trying to make it seven in a row. The Coyotes pinning their hopes once again on Jimmy Waite. In the first period, Coyotes up one nothing. The wings strike right back on a power play. Steve Eisman, side of the net, puts a laser beam upstairs, all tied up at one. It was a great goal. Wait gave him very, very little to shoot at. To the second we go here. Craig Janney behind the net. He is just leveled by Shanahan. Say good night. He was shaken up, but he was okay. Then the Coyotes shake up the wings. Barron carries it in for Chuck. He fires it past Osgood, and the Coyotes take the lead. And clearly, these fans here have been out in the sun a little too long. Wings bounce right back on the power play. It's Eisenman to Shanahan. He wires it by weight, and we're tied up again. A little bit later on, the wings of the power play again. Fedorov, he'll find Shanahan again. Beats weight. It's 3-2 for Detroit. Now, all right, you got to check this out. This crease in the end board, it proves to be fatal for Phoenix. Wings on the power play. Fedorov fires it in. It takes a weird bounce. And suddenly it's 4 2 wings. You got to see it on the replay. Crazy little bounce goes right off of Waite's skate. Believe it, Jim. The curse lives. The wings go on to win it 5 2. They knock out the Coyotes in six games. The Coyotes have not won a playoff series since 1987. Shanahan had two goals and one assist. After the game, he said getting by Phoenix was simply a matter of time and patience. You try and stay calm and say to your, you know, just convince yourself that as long as you're getting the chances, you're doing the right thing. Uh, it's when you're not getting in the zone or when you're playing on the perimeter that, uh, that there's a problem. But uh, I thought in the last two games, we had some really good chances and we were ready to bust open. There is no excuse in this dress room. Uh, we're disappointed. We are absolutely disappointed this season this year. You lose out in the first round with the caliber players we have. It's, it's, uh, you know, maybe it is time to make a change. Who knows? But it's, just, it's a frustrating situation. Next opponent is going to be a great team, whether it's Colorado or St. Louis. Yeah. Um, going to be a, a, a tough series for us, so we get a couple of days off, and um, we want to go home and relax for a couple of days and not have to play Game 7. We're able to do that. Well, in Boston, the Bruins were trying to force a Game 7 in their series with Washington. The Caps, notorious for blowing 3-1 series leads, probably felt a bit of heat when the Bruins shut them out in Game 5. They had no interest in putting their fans through another Game 7 experience, so off we go. No love lost between these foes, Mark Tenorti and Joe Thornton. Sergei Gonchar, the shot from the point, Richard Zednick. Redirects it by Byron Defoe, and it is 1-0 for the Caps. Peter Bondra back in the Washington lineup. Aggravates his right foot on this strange play, but he would be back. And when he does come back, they try to give him a greeting. Dave Ellett again, say hello to the boards. Go to the second period now. Sergei Samsonov goes around the net, comes in front. Beautifully done for the tying goal. 1-1, Boston on the board. Minutes later, though, Michael Pavanka in front for the ex-Bruin, Adam Oates, who gives the Caps the one-goal lead again. Third period, Chris Simon 
Yes, he gets the penalty for that. Bruins go to the power play. Anson Carter in the loose puck. And the quick shot beats only the goalie to tie it up again, 2-2. Caps getting frustrated. Oates slashing Anson Carter in the stomach there. No call. Late third, Bruins power play. Jason Allison to P.J. Axelson. Fires the shot, but it goes right into the pads of Kolzik. So we go to overtime. Darren Van Imp. The shot from the point, Ted Donato, has got a chance to force game seven there, but it goes off the post instead. And then Brian Bellows, an innocent looking shot, ends it in OT. Washington doesn't have to worry about blowing the 3-1 series lead. They win it in six, four games to two. The Caps moving on to the second round, even though Boston outshot them 49-33. And the Caps won all three games at the Fleet Center. Brian Bellows, the overtime winner. Not too bad for a guy they picked up late in the season. He spent most of his season playing hockey in Europe. I've learned one thing. Being negative only hurts the guys around you and, and hurts yourself. If we just think positive, positive, build the guy up next to you, he's going to play that much better. It's a team with a lot of uh, experience, a uh, team that... Uh, has uh, some winners, and uh, you know that's what it's all about, really. Uh, guys that are gonna you know, show the way, got a, guys that are gonna play hard, and uh, a great goalie. <laughs> I could honestly say uh, this series, um, you know, uh, we should still be playing hockey, and and that's uh, that, that's just the bottom line. It would have been a little easier to take if we didn't play well, maybe, but we played so well, and, you know, I never been on a team. <laughs> This edition of Sports Desk as Bill Guerin tries to lead on offense against the Avs, and Curtis Joseph remains the last line of defense in a mile high city. The Lakers getting pumped for game one of the West, but the Sonics are looking to deflate the Shack attack. Pedro Martinez is back in Montreal, but unfortunately only as a spectator as the Expos take on the Reds, while Henkin hopes to shed his early season woes against the Ace. The Cavalier is at the top of the class of 98 draft prospects. The Ticats get their top pick to sign on the line, and our plays of the week are breaking new ground and fences. A TSN Sports Desk ready to lower the boom. Well, one series in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs went to a seventh game, the Oilers and the Avalanche, and I think there's a pretty good bet that's where we're going to start. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Tolt in Toronto. And I'm Dave Randorf in Vancouver. Yeah, Dave, game seven, but I've got to admit, I thought the Oilers were going to be done like dinner in five. Yeah, I think a lot of people did, Mike, and not a lot of people gave the Oilers a chance. But you know what? Going into game five, with the Oilers down 3-1, there was talk that Curtis Joseph had yet to regain his playoff form of a year ago and steal a game for the Oilers. Well, he was solid that night with a 3-1 win. He was outstanding in Game 6, posting a 2-0 shutout. So the bad news for Colorado heading into the all-important Game 7 was Cujo seen to be showing his teeth again. And his team was looking to become just the 14th in NHL history to rally from a 3-1 deficit to win a series. And the Oilers get off to a good start on the power play. Back of the net is Herkus. Tony Herkus with a great feed to Yanni Ninema. One time, short side pass for Wah. One nothing orders. For a while looking a little shaky. Here's more proof of that. Look who's away. Bill Guerin from the feed and he goes five hole on Patrick Wah, his sixth of the playoffs, 2 nothing Oilers. He has in a bit of a hole at home going into the second and it gets deeper in a real hurry as there's a turnover at their own blue line and Kelly Bookberger is going to give it to Todd Marchand and he just flips it over a wall. Horrible looking goal and it's 3 nothing Edmonton. Meanwhile, down at the other end, here's the guy we were talking about, Cujo. Didn't have to make a whole lot of great saves but this one was a beauty, that's for sure. Holding up his end of the bargain, gets knocked out of position, scrambles back, reaches back, and robs Rene Corbet with the paddle of his stick. Here's another look. Look at this. He comes sliding in out of nowhere, gets that stick down, and steals one. Colorado was in trouble. They started to get that feeling over on their bench while Slats is kicking back, having a great time. 20 minutes away from a huge win. Early in the third, Oilers add to the lead. Lindgren's in alone now. He gets his own rebound here, follows the puck into the crease. He can do that. Swats it in, and now it was a blowout. 
Four nothing Oilers. Midway through the third, the fans were leaving Big Mac because they knew what you Oilers fans knew. This one was done. Cujo gets another shutout. Edmonton gets the win. And the incredible comeback from the 3-1 series deficit was complete. Bring on Dallas, says the Edmonton Oilers bench. It's the first time since 1993 that three Canadian-based teams have advanced to the second round. The Oilers play Dallas next. The Blues face Detroit. But as for this one, we get more now from Ken Chilibeck. For the second straight year, the Oilers have been the giant killers in the Western Conference. Last year, it was Dallas in the first round. This time, in even more dramatic fashion, coming back from a 3-1 to one deficit in games. This Oilers team now the 14th team in the last 60 years in the NHL to ever rebound from that kind of deficit and win a series. When we were down 3-1, I think it, we were still being effective. We were still wearing them down, and we continued to wear them down and do the same thing. You need bounces coming back against a team of that caliber, and we got the bounces, but I think we've earned a lot of them too. We played our hearts out, um, and, uh, you know, that's what, it, that's what it's going to take to keep moving up the ladder. So, uh, you know, we're happy right now, and we're ready to go down to Dallas and, uh, you know, play well down there, too. That's unbelievable. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was our never-say-die uh, never attitude. Uh, every guy in here took, uh, took, took it upon themselves to believe in that, and uh, from the coaches, uh, everybody, you know, believed that we were going to come back, and we were good enough to, to win the series. When you have 3-1 in the series, you have to find a way to get it done, and I don't know if we we're overconfident. I mean... It's such a shocking feeling right now that I don't think anyone's got the answers. A lot of keys in this series. The checking of the orders, keeping the likes of Peter Forsberg and Joe Sackick off the score sheet the last three straight games. The penalty killing. The Avs were 0-17 in two straight games with the extra man. But Curtis Joseph was at the top of the list, the reason the Oilers won, as he shut out the Avs for over eight straight periods of hockey. When the time came, he, he stepped up. We, we worked hard again, but they got some good shots, and he was there every time. And it gives you confidence to play in front of the goalie like that. Game five was obviously a, a big game for them, and uh, you know, they just got the momentum and rode it. And Cujo played great, and tonight their whole team was uh, a lot better than we were. They got some power plays early, and obviously they got a ton of talent out there, and we did a great job of killing it, and that was a big lift for us, and uh, might have been the key to the game. Obviously a disastrous end of the season for the Avalanche, even speculation about Mark Crawford's future with the hockey club. Maybe the Achilles heel in all of this for the Avalanche, simply they didn't have enough depth depth on their third and fourth line. The top guns just simply got worn out. For the Oilers, using all four lines and the depth they had, a big part to this series victory. The Oilers now have won all four straight seven-game appearances they played in dating back to 1990. Next stop, Dallas. Reporting from McNichols Arena in Denver, I'm Ken Chilovec for Sports Desk. All right, thanks very much, Ken. Now let's get to the NBA. The Seattle Supersonics like to make life interesting in the first round. Last year, they had to go the full five games before advancing. This year, the same thing. It took five to shake off the Timberwolves. And now that the big bad wolves have bit the dust, it's time for the Sonics to try and slay the Lakers. But I'll tell you what, that's not going to be very easy. Let's take a look. A big question for the Sonics. How do they contain this big... A's Mariners TSN tonight. Hey, feeling all alone? Confused? Well, Sports Desk has the answers to today's biggest questions. Would the Oilers strike in Game 1, or would the Stars shine in the Big D? Could the Sens solve only the goalie, or would the Caps sow their oats? Have the Montreal Canadiens created an international playoff incident? This is as big as the Lewinsky thing, I think, in the States going on right now. Is Patrick healthy enough to lend the Knicks a hand against Indiana? Can Stockton and the Jazz fill it up on the San Antonio Spurs? Could Canada steamroll Belarus at the World Championship? Was the rocket in full glare, or did the fireworks come from somewhere else? Did a couple of ex spos expose the spos at the big O? Will Oz be good or bad for the wings against St. Lou? Get set for a crash and banging leather flashing show. You ask for the moon, we deliver. The desk is next. Yes, sir. Let the games begin again. After a few days off, it was back on ice, but the team still alive in the chase for Lord Stanley's mug. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Toth in Toronto. And I'm Dave Randorf in Vancouver. You know, Dave, I don't think Ron Lowe is going to get voted in as president of the coaches fraternity. I mean, he got into that battle with Mark Crawford in the first round, and now he's feuding with Dallas bench boss Ken Hitchcock. Yeah, that's right. The question was, who exactly is Bush League here? Ron Lowe says Ken Hitchcock called him Bush during the regular season. Hitch says, no, no, he was calling Brian Marchman's tactics Bush. 
Whatever, the gloves were already off in what should be a nasty rematch from the best series of last year's playoffs. Edmonton back in Dallas to take on the Stars, and Cujo was looking for his third straight playoff shutout. Hasn't been done in 50 years, and it won't be done here. The shutout didn't last long. First period, Dallas power play. There you go. Zuba blasts one home three minutes in, one nothing Stars. About five minutes after that, another Dallas power play, and guess what? Zubov again with a big shot. He scores again. Just after the penalty expired there, so Ron Lowe, note to self, must stay out of box. 2-0, but in the second, Edmonton shows more intensity. Zelopukin rubs out Craig Muni, and the owner's fourth line makes it work offensively. Greer centers, Murray is stopped, but Zelopukin beats Belfour, and they're in it. It's 2-1. They outshot Dallas 17-5 in the, in the second period there, and there was plenty of nasty stuff as well as Waite catches Zubov from behind, and Zubov would be okay. Third period, they keep it coming. Marchand busts in, jabs at the rebound, but Belfort keeps it out. Then, moments later along the boards, Madano with a great-looking pass. Mike Keane cashes in, 3-1 Dallas, then a real dirty play. Grant Marshall with a butt end right to the face of Kelly Bookberger. Sather was furious. Bookberger was spotted. oh, look at that. He was sporting a nasty-looking shiner. Marshall gets five minutes for elbowing. A game misconduct. He will get more. But Dallas kills off the major, and in the dying seconds, Roman Hammerlick tries his luck, but Belfort was there all night long, and he was there again. He snares it. The Stars snare a 1-0 series lead. 3-1 was the final. The story really was Belfort as he makes 31 saves. Edmonton outshot Dallas 32-14. Mike Medano assisted on all three Dallas goals, but afterwards Edmonton was upset about losing, but they were furious with Marshall's hit on Bookberger. And it's as bad as a butt end as I've seen in a long time. In fact, I thought hockey was finished with those things. It's about, uh, it's about as bad as I've seen. Not only is a butt end, but it's a butt end in his eye. You know, and the part that surprised me was that he made a comment to Mike Greer. He said, uh, he said, your Bucky's been slashing guys all night, so he deserved what he got. So you don't see that happen in our game today. Well, I just, um, we were killing a penalty. I went to get it out, and next thing I know, um, I was blindsided. And, and uh, I really can't uh, remember too much from there. I can see a little bit, but, uh, you know, the license should be ready by Saturday. That's not good. The Senators and Capitals are happy to be staying alive, but they don't want to be the favorites. The Sens say the Caps should hold that title because they had more regular season points, but the Caps say the Sens won the season series between the two teams, so Ottawa is the favorite. Either both teams have a serious self-esteem problem or it's just the gamesmanship that goes with playoff hockey. Now, here's a guy who's definitely on top of his game. I'm talking about Damian Rhodes. He gets a start and goal after allowing just 11 goals in six games against the Devils, but the Caps getting great goaltending, too, from only the goalie. Point shot, the rebound and he takes it away from McEachern. Oh, for the love of the glove, what a save right there by Ole the goalie. Later, the Caps in a power play, but Gonchar gives it right to Gardner, who is going to feed it to Daniel, his brother, Daniel Alfredson, and he scores, and it was 1-0 for the Sens. But the Caps come back. Kelly Hansen point shot blocked, but sometimes that's a good thing because it rolls right to Zednik. In front, he goes upstairs on Rhodes. Just like that, the game is tied. Now, Ron Wilson has been inspiring the Caps with words of wisdom from the Wizard of Oz, and the fans obviously buying in. For the second period, the Caps showing some jump, but can they score? Oh, it's to Housley. Rhodes the save. There's a rebound, and he gets to that as well as he stops Joey Juno. Later, Gonchar, the great feed to Oates. In alone, breakaway express. There you go, and the Caps take themselves a 2-1 lead. Now, either Jacques Martin is upset or he's got gum in his shoe. I don't know, but I do know that in the third period, things get worse for the Sens. Bondra, Peter Bondra, across the line. Special agent Peter Bondra rips the 40-footer, and that made it 3-1. Less than two minutes after that, the Caps break in. Juno to Dale Hunter. He loads it up for Brian Bellows. He shoots and he scores, just like he did when he was playing with the Germans. To make it 4-1, Rhodes is done. Ron Tugnut on the scene, and actually that seems to give the Sens kind of a lift here. The Ash in the shot, Dacko will try to bang home the rebound. He does, and that made it 4-2. Now later, the Sens appear to get another one. Take a look, McEachern cutting in. Pulls a one stop, the rebound gets tucked underneath. Gets his toe on it, and then Mike Eagles covers his hand on the puck, but then it slides in. Goal? No. Penalty shot? No. Mark Fassette says the whistle is blown. Uh, Martin peering into the sign, but it's not the sign he's looking for. The Caps hold on, and they do take game one, 4-2, your final. Ole, the goalie, I told you he was good. He stopped 36 shots as the Sens actually outshot the Caps. 38-23. Down at the other end, Damian Rhodes would tell you he wasn't at his best, but Washington says, heck, 
We didn't notice. Oh, what goal are you going to blame him on? You know, um, you know, the first goal was a rebound, you know, behind him. Michael's a breakaway. Uh, Bonsai is a great shot off the post. You know, which goal are you going to blame on when Brian's is in alone? I had to give credit to Washington. They played a good game. But uh, I, don't, I don't think we came out with the kind of emotion we need to win. And, uh, you know, we got to get ready for the next one. This one's done. It's going to take everyone in there to regroup. And, um, you know, we're going to have to play better, no doubt. It's going to take a real good hockey team. That team's playing well over there. And that's going to take a real good hockey team to beat those guys. Well, after losing game one of their Eastern semi with the Pacers, the New York Knicks can use all the help they can get. Send Bears. At your steel dealer, you'll find a complete line of chainsaws sold and serviced by professionals who really know their business. And right now, steel German engineered chainsaws are sale priced from just $299.95. Steel, built to last, priced to sell. There's nothing like the feeling of a new car. The look, the shine, the smell. Armor All Protectant. It shines, it protects. It's new car juice. TSN's got your video golf magazine. It's a weekly wrap-up of the golf tour. Catch Acura World of Golf on TSN. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm David Pratt, along with my partner, Mike Toth. Mike, here is an amazing stat. Now, dating back to 1993, the Montreal Canadiens had been in 14 playoff games that went into overtime and had won all 14. Yeah, David, I remember that 93 playoff run you were talking about where they won the 10 straight overtime games. The ghosts certainly on their side, and they're going to need all those ghosts again <laughs> to deal with Dominic Hashig. They might need more than ghosts. I don't know. This guy is just incredible. I don't know if this guy is human, to be honest about it. First period, he shines. First, he stops Rosinski. Then he stones. Then he dealing the rebound. Man, he came to play. You knew that was going to happen. Still in the first, the Sabres attacking Brian Holzinger. He's going to let the shot go through a crowd, and he scores. And the Buffalo Sabres have something to work with Habs getting kind of frustrated. Breeze Bois sits on Michael Groshek and then he gets tough. Gotta play physical in the playoffs. You just don't want to go over the edge. A little later, the Sabres in the power plays. The Canadians went over the edge. Now, Willie sends it across for Jeff Sanderson. He beats Andy Mogan. All of a sudden, it was 2 nothing but a buff. Hashik, he's not finished. And he finishes the first period in style. Robbing Shane Corson in tight. Then in the second, the Dominator doing what he does best. He's freelancing. He's ad-libbing. He's doing everything he can. Savage can't tuck it home. Wow, the physical play would continue. Holzinger nailed right into the linesman who goes right into the Buffalo bench. He is not welcome there. You know that. Third period, still 2-0 to the Sabres. And here come the Habs. Turner Stevenson, great move, great goal. He is human. He bleeds just like the rest of us, does the Dominator. And it's not over yet. The Habs attacking right off the ensuing faceoff here. They come. Benny D, what a great playoff he's had. He scores again, lets that thing fly. Two goals in 10 seconds. Unbelievable. We are going to overtime. Which one of these young men will be the hero in the extra session? That is is the question on everybody's minds. Let's find out. Early in the extra frame, Turner Stevenson, that's a bad giveaway. Jeff Sanderson jumps all over that thing. He scores. He's the hero. So is that guy. That's all the heroes they need. Just get somebody to score the overtime winner, and Dominic Hasek will do the rest as well. Buffalo does it again. 3-2, the final score. And you look at this thing, and Hasek making 46 saves as the Canadians outshot the Sabres 48-25. That's uh, incredible. And here's another stat the Habs are looking at. They were 0-7 for 7 on the power play. We get more now on this hockey game from TSN's Michael Whalen. The win by the Sabres brought to an end a string of 14 overtime victories by the Canadians. A tough loss for the Montreal team that outplayed the Sabres in the second and third period only to have Dominic Hasek hold down the fort, facing a whopping 48 shots. I haven't expected uh, anything like that, you know, especially in our building, you know. But like I say, since the second period, you know, they were, they skate so fast and, uh, and I think they were a better team in the second and third period, but like I say, you know, we scored two in the first and we scored in overtime. Besides losing the game, I think we got to be really happy with the way we played. Uh, we skated well, we knew there was a skating game. Uh, they really uh, were first on the puck in the first ten minutes, but after that we adjusted, we played a lot better, and uh, from the second period on we played a great game. The Sabres had completely outplayed the Canadians in the first period, but then inexplicably fell into a defensive shell in the second. It almost cost them the game. 
game. Today was a case that uh, you saw Dominic Hasek win a hockey game for us. Uh, you know, he has he's done that for us uh, periodically throughout the season, and uh, tonight was one of those nights for him. I think guys are disappointed, but you know what? I really believe there's you know the guys in here feel that if we play this way, uh, we get the same type of effort every night. That uh, you know we'll get more wins than we will losses if we get the same effort as we did tonight. And and uh, obviously guys are a little discouraged, but uh, you know we'll bounce back Sunday. Winning the first game of a series can't be overemphasized in this year's playoffs especially. Keep in mind that the team that won the first game in round one eventually went on to win the series. We'll see about this one. Michael Whalen, TSN in Buffalo. To the Blues and the Wings, St. Louis still missing Al McKinnis uh, with that groin injury. Chris McAlpine gets in the lineup into the first period. It's McAlpine who up in Steve Eisenman here and he draws a penalty for it. But it's St. Louis breaking out shorthanded. Todd Gill beats Chris Osgood. The Blues first shot on net. It's 1-0. A little bit later on, the Blues keep coming. Dimitri Nifty, little tip there. Nice stuff, but Osgood is just there for the save. Then Grant Fuhr just takes over. Lindstrom, then Eisenman. Both of them deny. Let's get out of the second period. Detroit still looking for the equalizer. Lariatov shoots. LaPointe gets credit for the goal. It made it 1-1. Early in the third period now, Blues had a 5-on-3 power play. Jim Campbell deposits the rebound. It made it 2-1 for St. Louis. A little bit later on, Brad Hall cruising in front. He buries it. Takes the hit. That made it 3-1 for the Blues. And then they pour it on. Jeff Cortnell here. Set in all alone. Osgood makes the save. Campbell right there to... Pot the rebound, 4-1 to one for the Blues. But the Wings do not give up on this one. Some great passing here on a power play. Holmstrom scores on his second chance. However, St. Louis remains a perfect 5-0 in the playoffs. Final score on this one was 4-2. Now with more on the game, here's Darren Detition. After eight days off, the St. Louis Blues looked anything but lethargic, pressed into action just three minutes into the game. Not only did they kill off a five-on-three, they also got a shorthanded goal in the process. Yeah, we're fortunate to get one off their power play. And, um, you know, everybody can, you can use the eight days in two ways. You can just say, well, we're, we're well rested. We, we got that extra bit of practice, and, and I felt, you know, that extra bit of practice is probably good for us. It's a special teams game. We can't take any stupid penalties and put them on the power play. And we had our chance on the power play we had to go out there and, and put one in the net and we, uh, we took advantage of it it appeared as though st louis was going to be hampered greatly by the absence of al mckinnis who's out with an apparent groin injury they went 0 for 6 in the first two periods on the power play but to start the third they scored on their own five on three and that really swung the momentum i thought we played a, an excellent overall game considering we haven't played in a while and it's hard to just jump into playoff atmosphere hockey uh, so uh, that's a big win for us we had a lot of guys uh, play really well while Jimmy Campbell supplied some of the offensive heroics with two goals, Grant Fear was equally brilliant between the pipes as he stopped 29 Detroit shots. One game doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, there's a lot of work to do still, so we're going to have to play better come the, the next game because I mean, you know they're going to get better. I mean, you play the game whether you win or lose, you play it and you uh, go over what happened, the good things and bad, and prepare for the next game. So St. Louis improves to 5-0 and while the Red Wings fall to 4-3 and in the playoffs, and now the onus is completely on Detroit to win game number two come Sunday. They can ill afford to fall further behind in this series and bounce back like they did against Phoenix because the St. Louis Blues, simply put, are a much better hockey club than the Coyotes. Darren Detition, TSN, Detroit. Friday was a long, long day for the Edmonton Oilers. Not only did they have to put back the pieces following their loss in game one to the Dallas Stars, but they also had to try to make sense of an NHL ruling that just didn't make any sense. Ken Chilovic has that story. I don't agree with his call, but he has the right to make the call his way, and we got to get over it. So it's a good way of getting the team focused on what we have to do now. What Glenn Sather was referring to is Grant Marshall's hit on Kelly Bookberger late in game one. Sather was incensed with the hit, saying it was an intent to injure and Marshall should be suspended. Brian Burke ruled there'd be no suspension, just a thousand dollar fine. As the Stars called the Oilers Bush League when Brian Marchman hit Mike Madano, resulting in an injury earlier in the year. Now Sather is reversing that role. I would think that this is as much Bush League, if more, if not more, because here's a guy going after somebody's eye. The way you look at the camera, I don't know how they can see it any different, but uh, 
you know the league will see it in different ways and uh, and it's playoffs and things are called um, a little differently. The Oilers are getting used to having villains involved in these playoffs. Bill Guerin was dubbed Bill the Butcher when in game one against Colorado. He cut Peter Forsberg on the cheeks for nine stitches. Now the villain is Dallas's Grant Marshall. And if the Oilers needed something to heat up this series, this could be the answer. It's always funny, but I think this is legitimate. I don't think, uh, you know, uh, Slats is a, a kind of guy to send things in all the time. I think this was a, a dangerous play and a uh, disappointing result. With, but uh, like I said, we don't care if he's suspended or not, you know. Ooh. Even without that hit on Kelly, if we didn't rally, there's going to be very something very wrong with the hockey club. I think that uh, we're in a situation right now that we realize, and we realized full well before the game started, this is not going to be an easy chore. And it's, uh, I'll tell you right now, if it's a short one, we aren't going to be in it. Don't look for the Oilers to do any headhunting in this next game. They realize that penalties would kill them, especially against the good power play of the Dallas Stars. Now, Ron Lowe may make another lineup change going into game number two. He wasn't very happy with Andre Kovalenko's play. Kovalenko played his first game of the playoffs. He had taken Scott Fraser's position. It could be quite possible that Fraser will be back in and Kovalenko would be out. Reporting from Reunion Arena in Dallas, I'm Ken Chilebeck for Sports Desk. Okay, Ken, the Philadelphia Flyers never found a goalie they were comfortable with, and they are sitting on the sidelines. The Ottawa Senators seem to have their man in Damian Rhodes, but he was kind of shaky in Thursday's loss in game one of their series with the Capitals, and now there's some question about who will be between the... His battle scars. Yeah, he's got a great one there. First period here. Nina's shot is tipped over Ed Belfort. It's on the roof of the net here. Scott Fraser whacks it down. It's in the goal, but didn't... No, the whistle was blown. Yeah, let's move on. Meantime, Curtis Joseph did not face a single shot in the first period. Onto the second. Mike Keane fires a high shot from the slot. That is the first star shot on goal. Do you believe that? Then Darren Hatcher takes the shot at McCammon. He drops to the ice. Hatcher gets two minutes, so on the power play. Stars scrambling. Belford out of position. Doug Waite. The shot is going wide. Somehow it goes up Belford's rear end. What a weird goal. one nothing Oilers. Late in the second here. Mike Fadano lays the lumber on Marinov. Marinov hits the bench. This is going to be a nasty affair. Third period. Belongs to Cujo. He has two shutouts in three games. And then the star attack. Brian Scrudland centers out for Pat Verbeek. Cujo with the save right there. Then he covers up. Then it's Zubov. He will center out to Verbeek. Cujo sprawls for the save. Then it goes back to the point. Sador winds up, lets the shot go. Cujo right there to shut the door. Big smile from Slats as the Oilers had an empty netter to beat the Stars. 2-0. That's your final. Four of the Oilers' playoff wins have come on the road. Cujo gets his seventh career playoff shutout. And now with more in the game, here's our own Ken Chilebeck. Oilers took up where they left off in game one. They swarmed the Dallas defensive zone, beating the Stars to the puck on virtually every occasion. Team defense was the key to the Oilers' success. Great out game. I thought we shut them down in the neutral zone. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of neutral zone turnovers, which was what we wanted to do. We got shots. They weren't counted. I know. Uh, I know uh, Dave Reed got two. I know uh, Chambers got one on the power play. But still, that's not you know the reason why we um, you know didn't play well. You know we just didn't play well. Specialty teams another big factor in the Oilers' victory. Now Dallas had three power plays in the first period alone and didn't even get a shot on Curtis Joseph. And after the Oilers went 0 for 6 on the power play in Game One, Doug Waite's game winner came with a two-man advantage. Obviously, that was a big goal to get on the power play. Hammer made a tremendous play, and I was able to get it in the empty net. But uh, uh, we were very confident with our defensive play up to that point, and uh, we, we, we really played stellar defensively tonight, uh, and we also created some things. You know, obviously, that's not our that wasn't our game plan to come in and uh, play like that for two periods. Uh, it's just not acceptable in playoff hockey. In your own building, you got to be able to get up for these games, and, uh, you know, we, we have to uh, really... Look, look ourselves in the mirrors and, and say what kind of team are we. All the way down the line, from the first line to the fourth line to the first pairing to the second, the third pairing defensemen, I mean, uh, they everybody did the job tonight. So a big win for the Edmonton Oilers to earn the split here in Dallas, and obviously another big night for Curtis Joseph. This was his third shutout in the last four playoff games. Game number three now, Monday night in Edmonton. Reporting from Reunion Arena in Dallas, I'm Ken Chilebeck for Sports Desk. Thanks, Ken. Speaking of goaltenders, Ron Tugnot getting the nod for Game 2 against the Caps. Gets tested early. Chris Simon, great opportunity. Tugnot turns him away. At the other end of the ice, Sens get a good chance. Chris Murray turned away by Olaf Kolzig. Nice glove hand save. Midway through the second. Things get interesting. Brendan Witt, slot scores. 
and it's 1-0. A minute and four seconds later, Essa Tikkanen gets taken right out of the play by Andreas Dackel. No call. Alexa Yashin walks in and scores. 1-1 one, one tie. 24 seconds later, Brian Bellows feeds Joe Juno. Juno goes backhand and scores. 2-1, to one, three goals in a minute and 28 seconds. Sens trying to tie it up again. Yashin with a great opportunity. Coles it dives and stops it. Washington taking advantage of its opportunities. Joe Riki lets the shot go. Mike Eagles looked like he got a piece of it. Didn't get credit for it. Riki did. Three to one. Scary moment for the Cavs. Peter Bondra gets nailed by Lance Pitlick. Bondra left the game, did not return. Just over a minute left in the second period. Richard Zednick with time, uses it, and scores. Caps get four goals on five shots in the second. They're up four to one. Sends a little bit frustrated. They're down five one on the power play. Igor Kravchuk coughs it up. Adam Oates to Juno to Oates to the back of the net. Six one is your final score on a long night for Ron Tugnut. Olaf Kolzik made 30 saves. Sends outshoot the Capitals 31 to 18, but only get one goal. The Sends 0 for seven on the power play. With more on this game. Here's Mark Bunting. The Capitals have emphatically broken the Tugnut hex. Ignoring Tugnut's dominance of them the last two seasons, the Capitals pumped in six goals on 18 shots, leaving the Senators with two goalies who've had their confidence shaken. I think that was just an old-fashioned old butt kicking, really. Um, things started to go poorly, and they just uh, got worse. He stoned us in the last two years uh, in the regular season, but now I think it's playoffs. we got to come with a better attitude, and we just want to get a lot of shots on that and uh, try to get second chances on them. Either way they go, they, they both have, uh, you know, it's they have two qualified goalies. I mean, you can't really blame Tugman. I mean, the shots he was beat on, you know, were, were opportunities that, you know, from 10 feet out, guys drilling them top shelf. I mean, those are opportunities you don't expect to get in the playoffs. It looks like we're, you know, almost confused out there. I mean, we didn't... Uh, didn't do, I mean, in the defensive zone, we didn't have good position at all, and they, I mean, they're just all over us. Alexi Yashin was the Settlers' most noticeable player. Because of his ongoing shadow dance with Essa Tikkanen, his goal, thanks to a pick on Tikkanen by Andreas Dackel, and for being the target of a couple of Washington muggings. Yashin faced up to the Capitals' challenge, but he didn't face the media after the game. Well, it's both ways. You look at them uh, first goal, you know, in a diagonal, take my legs off. And, uh, you know, it's both ways. You know, I try to do best, and I got, I got a penalty today, and they're behind the net. But uh, it's uh, up to referee. You never know what they're calling and what they're not calling. The Senators are in a tough spot right now. They're down two games. They know they haven't played very well, and they have a goalie dilemma. But they're hoping that home ice can help get them back on track. Also, Peter Bondra left the game in the second period. He was shaken up after a Lance Pitlick hit. Mark Bunting, TSN in Washington. Thanks, Mark. In the opening round, this... Happy Mother's Day, Mom. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Even you, George Carl. All good sons had gifts for Mom. Yeah, you gotta love Mom. The Sabres look to rattle the Habscape. The Blues are singing the you-know-what in Motown. Playing Sweden, not a delight for Canada at the World Hockey Championship. Yell if you love Ma! Moore is muy macho in the Rio 400. And the song remains the same in the Formula One circuit. Seattle faces a sonic boom in L.A. Charlotte tries to keep the Bulls from taking a stranglehold. The Pacers go to the floor against the Knicks. And everyone knows the mailman's extra busy on Mother's Day. Even Junior had a special delivery. And that's for you, Ma! Colorado gives the Expos a rocky afternoon, but that's as good as it gets. No, not Jack Sports Desk. Top of the world, Ma. No one should be forced to go back to work or school first thing Monday morning without being fully informed on what happened over the weekend in the world of sport. And that's why we're here. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Gino Retta. And I'm David Pratt. Now, Gino, you had a tough call to make on Sunday. You could have spent it with the mother and the family at home or spend the afternoon with the TV set, the Montreal Canadiens, right? Now, luckily for me, my mom lives in Calgary. <laughs> Good scenario for you, David. So what did you get for mom on Mother's Day? Well, the Sabres' Matthew Barnaby couldn't take his mom out for Sunday brunch. That's because he had to work, of course, so he did the next best thing. Got her a ticket to the game, and a private box, no less. But as the Habs quickly found out, 
that was just the beginning of the gift. Speaking of moms, Dominic Hasek, the mother of all goaltenders, and his counterpart, Andy Moog, drawing a lot of attention in this game. Early on, Montreal applying the pressure. Igor Ulanov, the shot! Hasek gets a piece of it, but not enough. It beats him. 1-0 Montreal. Just 80 seconds later, Matthew Barnaby working in front of the net. Matthew Barnaby trying to do it alone. Loses the puck, but no problem. Michael Groshik is there for the scraps. Pops it in. Fifth of the postseason. Game tied at one to the second period. Game tied at two. Mark Recchi on the break. Mark Recchi's first shot is stopped. Second one, he bats it in out of the air. 3-2 Montreal. 28 seconds later, Dixon Ward from the slot. Scores! Game tied at three, and the seesaw battle continues with Matthew Barnaby behind the net. Pulling a Gretzky, scores. Four to three, Buffalo after two periods of play. Then just 13 seconds into the third is Barnaby again. The sniper, short side. Five three, Buffalo. Later in the period, things only get worse for Montreal. Andy Moog is just nailed. He's shaken up, leaves the game. Jocelyn and Tebow comes in to replace him, but the damage had already been done. Late in the game with Tebow on the bench for the extra attacker. It's Barnaby again. Barnaby finds the empty net. Hat trick. 6-3 Sabres. And on Mother's Day, Barnaby couldn't have made Mom more proud. The fans think he's the man. With a four-point game, Buffalo raises the roof. With a 6-3 win, they now lead the series two games to nothing. So the series now switches to Montreal, where the Sabres are unbeaten in their last six visits, 4-0-2 during that stretch. And Moog is still a question mark, trying to recover from just getting nailed in the net in this game. And according to Matthew Barnaby after the game, winning game two is really, really big. I think last game we didn't have any focus, and, and this, uh, this game we wanted to prove to everyone and ourselves that we had some focus and we were determined. And every time they scored, we seemed to rally back, and that's been the, the case all year. So we've had a lot of come-behind wins in the year uh, in the third period, and I just think that was what we wanted to prove to ourselves and to everyone that we weren't the team that played in that first game. We, we didn't play Montreal Canadiens hockey tonight. We didn't play. We didn't use our, our speed. Uh, you know, we didn't do a lot of things that we should be doing. And, uh, you know, we created a lot of turnovers for them, and uh, you know, that's their, their game. And we have to get back to the basic games and uh, play our style of hockey if we want to beat these guys. Since the playoffs began, the St. Louis Blues have been on a serious roll. Five games, five wins. Sooner or later, you knew it had to catch up to them, and it did. First, the Blues lost defenseman Al McKinnis with a groin pull. Then on Sunday, they took on a Detroit team looking to even up their series. Let's get out of the Blues and the Wings. The Wings looking to win one for Mom in Game 2. The Wings come out hitting. Kirk Nolte throws one on Chris Pronger, then teams up with Koser on Chris McAlpine. Now that somehow gives the Wings a little bit of spark here. Thomas Holstrom races in. He feeds Brendan Shanahan, but Fjord right there. One nothing Blues. Now watch this. Igor Larianov. Nice little tip ahead here. He finds Martin Lapointe, who squeezes it by Fjord. Power play goal. That made it 1-1. Chris Osgood was absolutely great in the second. Pierre Turgeon gets absolutely stoned by Osgood. And then the wings keep flying. Sergei Fedorov finds Holstrom, who undresses Grant Fuhr. What a great goal. Three to one for the wings. And the wings kept hitting. Martin Lapointe flips Pellerin head over heels. Yikes. Osgood remains solid here. Turgeon, wide open net. Osgood stretches out. No. Then, a moment when everyone, I mean everyone, held their breath. Chris Pronger takes a slap shot in the ribs. He goes down. Then he got up, and then he collapsed again. He was on the ice for several minutes. Real concern for everyone at the game. He was taken to the hospital. He is all right. Then Terry Yake takes a shot right here to the head. It caught his helmet, but it did draw some blood. He is also doing fine. The Wings win a tough one. Final score, 6-1. to one. So the Blues lose for the first time in the 98 playoffs. After the game, Pronger was checked out at a nearby hospital. X-rays were negative, and EKG was normal. He is in good condition right now. He is expected to be released Monday morning. It could have been much, much worse. It's not a common thing, but it, you know, when an inmate gets hit over the chest wall, over the heart areas, it certainly can cause arrhythmias, and uh, the potential is there.
you know, for something more serious, but fortunately, you know, it didn't happen this time. You realize how vulnerable you are, and, and now, you know, you just pray the kids, you know, he, he, he's conscious, so that's a good thing, and he's breathing fine, and I'm sure he's going to be all right, and, you know, that's all you can do is pray that everything works out, because, you know, at the time, you know, there's a kid laying there unconscious, and you don't know whether he's going to breathe or he isn't going to breathe, and that's frightening. I felt like everybody got a big punch in the stomach after that. It's a sick feeling for all the players, and um, nobody likes to see that. Once again, he should be fine. All right, let's face it. Champion, but he's injured right now, so into the fold steps Ernesto Senna. And Monday was the weigh-in day. Grant bringing a 31-1 record into this defense with 17 of those Ws coming by KO. He weighed in at 159 pounds. There's Ernesto Senna, ranked fifth by the WBO. He comes into this fight as well, tipping the old Toledos, as they say, at 159 pounds. We're going to take a break, and we're back with more. Stick with us, everybody. Sometimes you just have to want it more. When more points comes down to more passion. When you'd rather wound your body than your pride. When getting to heaven means going through hell. And either you have it in you or you don't. Gatorade, is it in you? Syntec. We then ran it over 160 kilometers per hour and waited and waited and waited. You see, Syntec has a unique molecular structure that bonds to engine parts, protecting them under the most torturous conditions. And if a little Syntec protects this well, imagine what a full oil change can do. Castrol Syntec Full Synthetic protects in ways other oils can. It is a case study in aerodynamics, control, and power made with an abiding conviction that one car can change the way you look at all cars. Introducing the daring new A6 from Audi. In the wind tunnel, it whispers. On the Autobahn, it screams. Okay, time now for the AT&T highlight of the night. Let's take a look. We're going to get back to Pittsburgh for this one. Kevin Young is the man with a bat in his hands. He drives it to right, but there's a problem. Larry Walker is out there. He is on the run, and he can run, and he can catch. He's a five-tool guy, makes the grab, tries to get the man and double him back at first there. That was Donnie Wall, but uh, they can't get him. But Larry Walker does make the catch. All right, one more time, we'll check in with David Pratt. David, we were talking earlier about the NHL awards uh, soon to be handed out and the Coach of the Year candidates, and I think Pat Burns is locked to win the NHL Coach of the Year. And the NBA, they're also talking about their Coach of the Year. Well, i got to tell you, Mike, Tuesday, all the attention should be on Larry Bird. The Associated Press is now saying that he has been named NBA Coach of the Year. As for the Memorial Cup, Portland and Valdor will meet on Tuesday night. And in Edmonton, both the Oilers and the Stars will get a day off, and trust me, they can use it after Game 3. I hear you, David. Hey, just a quick tennis note. Chris Woodruff has been forced to drop out of the French Open because of an injury, and that opens the door for Canadian Daniel Nestor. He's going to take part in the French. We've got a D part. So long, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Zen. Hey, we're going to 
kiss and tell in this edition of The Desk. On the ice in Edmonton, the Oilers, a big hit with the Stars. While in Ottawa, the Capital Series continues, and we'll tell you who's earning his money. The Blues get some good news because Chris Pronger is feeling a whole lot better. Will golf be saving their best for the Memorial Cup? Off the ice, the NHL announces its award nominees, and you know who's dominating that list. And baseball, O oh, is for open as they raise the roof at Olympic Stadium. In Arizona, Wood, Carey, pitch another jam against the Diamondbacks. Only in baseball can a walker be sliding. Hey, it's the beginning of the week, and everybody knows what that means. Plays, 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 plays of the week, roll call. Plays, plays, plays of the week, roll call. May I remind you to keep your feet firmly on the ground. The sign says it all. TSN Sports Desk is coming up next. Yes, welcome to Sports Desk. The Edmonton Oilers are home. The Ottawa Senators are home. It's NHL playoff time. David Pratt is here. Everything is perfect in the world. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Toth in Toronto. And I am David Pratt in Vancouver. Now, the reason I like working with David so much is he's a movie buff just like me. Yeah. Deep Impact, number one, David, at the box office. I saw it Monday with the TSN Movie Club. We gave it three out of five pucks. <laughs> Not bucks, David, pucks. That's the rating system we use. Wasn't realistic, though. I mean, a, a wave that big, nobody surfing? I, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't get it. You're a regular maybe, maybe, Spielberg. I never thought about that before. <laughs> well, it was the East Coast. Maybe it was yeah. the West Coast. It would have been different. All right. Forget about the comets crashing into the sea and Godzilla's shoe size. The biggest show in Edmonton right now is Cujo, starring Curtis Joseph. Joseph shut out the Dallas Stars in Game 2. His third shutout of these playoffs. On Monday night, Cujo and his supporting cast were looking to put on another show in Game 3. Belfort and the Stars try to change the momentum. First period. Belfort with a big elbow right there on Ryan Smith. Yeah, two minutes for the Eagle for being so stupid. Here, Oilers with the best chance of the period. Doug Waite behind the D. Stoned once and then stoned again. Wow. Great goaltending. Lots of physical play in the game. Mike Greer just rocks Sean Chambers there. Second period. Dallas frustrated by Curtis Joseph. Cujo has stopped 88 of 91 shots in the last four games. Mike Modano centers up to Greg Adams, fights off Ryan Smith there, but there he is, Joseph, with the good save. Oilers right back, two on one here. Doug Waite to Billy Garrett. Belford with the pad save. That was the best save of the night. Oiler fans, really, all that's missing there is the banjo, right? Third period, uh, Greg, I'll hear about that. Greg Adams to Mike Modano. Cujo is there to make the save. Again, late in the period. Wait, watch the hit here on Keene. And Garen will get the loose puck. He's steaming in. Ed Belfort with a poke check. And guess what, kids? We're going to OT. And all the fans have got that funny feeling. Just five seconds into OT. Ludwig, the bad pass. Lindgren gathers up the loose puck. He fires it. Belfort there again with the save. Then Scott Fraser with the shot, the rebound, but Greg DeFries cannot get to it. Then Needham with a bad clear. Benoit Hogue gets it, snaps it home. And Bob Ganey celebrates along with the Stars. What a thriller. Here's one more look. Hey, what was Needham thinking about? But no question, Hogue, he really did make the most of it as the Stars celebrate their win. The final score, one nothing for the Dallas Stars. Ed Belford made 28 saves for his fourth career playoff shutout. Hey, Cujo finished with 27 saves. Game four Wednesday in Edmonton. After the game, Ninema tried to explain himself. I guess everybody saw what happened. I, I had a puck there. I had lots of time. and uh, I tried to flip the puck up high over that guy in the middle. and. Uh, I had a long see if I was tired, then I don't know what I was doing. I think uh, this is going to be a big push for us and uh, emotional, and uh, uh, it kind of keeps everybody uh, happy now. There was more than one mistake in the hockey game by both hockey clubs. I mean, you look at it, and the final one comes from Yanni. Well, that's, that's, you have to live with those things. As the game went on, we, we started to play with more and more confidence, and, uh, you know, we knew coming into the building that uh, if we're going to win on the road, against Edmonton, we're going to have to win one or two nothing. You know, the good citizens of Ottawa have had to put up with a lot of misery over the years. Bad politicians, the Ottawa Rough Riders, and the Ottawa Senators. Now, the politicians, of course, are still there, but the Rough Riders are gone, and the Senators are no joke. They have become heroes of the hill, and boy, they need the fans' help to get back in their series with the Capitals, and the fans came to cheer the hometown boys. You knew that was going to happen. They get a loud reception from the hometown fans, and the Sens come out all fired up because of that. There you go. The fans are behind them, and they know that. Bruce Gardner goes after Oates, so Joey Juno jumps in, and the result? Why, it's going to be a sense power play. That's what happens. Igor Kravchak, though, is going to be stopped by Kolzeg. Zoltai is stopped. So is Daniel Alfredson, but Esatikinen says, I'm going to clear this thing. 
Oh, but he clears it right into his own net, and Alfredson got credit for the goal, so it was 1-0. Just minutes after that, Zoltak again to Cunningworth. Great feed to Daniel, my brother. Daniel Alfredson, his second straight goal, the Senators in front, 2-0. Now it's 2-1 for the Sens, but Kerry Fraser says, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to give him another power play opportunity, and Chris Phillips with a point shot. Alfredson right there with a great tip. Hand-eye coordination, and that's great. Alfredson with the first period hat trick. He is the hat trick hero. He is the hometown hero, but the Caps have a hero. This man here, Peter Bondra, says, yeah, my stick is uh, pretty good here. Give me a chance to work with it. They do. As he pots a rebound, that chopped it down to 3-2, and that was a power play goal. Then Ottawa gets another power play. Alexi Yashin, will he make it work? You heard that. That's a good noise. That's some beautiful noise. Off the outside post and in to make it 4-2. There's Damien. Stay gold, pony boy, Damien Rhodes. But he looked actually shaky in the second. Zednik, whoa, that's a bad goal for Rhodes to give up 4-3 after two. But Rhodes got better. Nicholas in for Gonchar. Rhodes makes the save. Oh, blonde ambition right there. And he covers the rebound. Still 4-3 late in the game. Ronnie Wilson calls a timeout. He says, boys, this is what we're going to do. So Ottawa says, boys, this is what we're going to do. The Capitals seem to get the idea a little better because they were all over the Senators in the final few seconds. Now look at Zednik. He's all alone. Get that guy right there in the blue. They don't. He gets a shot off. But Rhodes, oh, stay golden. Pony boy is right because he gets to that puck. And Ottawa gets a victory. They hold on 4-3, the final score. The Sens is actually out shooting Washington 34-17. So, again, only the goalie was very good. Ottawa, meantime, the big story, 3-5 for five with the power play. But, of course, they also gave up a couple of power play goals to the Caps. They want to rectify that situation. But the bottom line is this. Damian Rhodes, he was the man of the moment again. How would he react? How would he play? Well, he was shaky at times. But, as you saw, he was good when he had to be good. It was just one of those nights where I was fighting it and... Uh, you know, I thought the goals I got were good goals, and and uh, you know, fortunate for me at the end, I got to feel the puck a couple times, and then uh, be able to make that save at the end of the game. I have to give give me every credit to the Senators. They play well, 20 minutes, and uh, every time when we got it one goal back, they go into up again. You know, it's a playoff right now, and it's hard. You know, you never can uh, let the team going uh, two up, but. Uh, they play well. It was obviously a huge game for them. Uh, you know, you got to give them some credit. They're a very good hockey team over there. You know, we expected it. Uh, it happens. You know, I don't think anybody here expected uh, a sweep or anything like that. A Stanley Cup playoff game seemed large.